Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the last of the 200s, show number 299. Yes, we have been that consistent every week for, we're in our seventh year, actually. Um, whoa, 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 who's that? We're being hacked, Dean. Oh, oh my, my goodness. God. <laughs> Say it isn't so. How'd you get on this show, Missy? <laughs> Google t-shirt queen showing off. You showed up at the at the Google Plex. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the Google store. I did. Like I know, right? Ten years cool? ago. But yeah, well, yeah, but I could tell by the logo. It's like, you know, that's one of those logos that you know you can actually tell when people went there because the logo, of course, changes over time. And and it's like I have a t-shirt and somebody says, Oh, dude, you're back there when it was cool. I'm like, what? This is your shirt. Because I had one of the ones from 2001. And it was very blockish, very uh Times Roman at the time. And uh I had actually been given it because we used to go to the uh, conferences. They're, they're now SMX conferences. I forget what they were called before, but Google used to throw a party, the Google party. And you go to the the, the, the uh, campus and you could talk to the engineers one-on-one, -on -one, like you're all just partying, drinking beer and stuff. And uh, they give you t-shirts. And, you know, I didn't know at the time. I was like, you know, throw it in the pile. Like, okay, I got a t-shirt. Now it's like, oh, I have a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> actually, one, it's a really nice um, t-shirt, but... When the when I went out there, I it was when they were rolling out Google Glass. You remember? So I got. Oh I yeah, pictures. yeah. Before everybody thought they were glass holes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to cool. try those on, and it was really, you know, like I have pictures of me with, you know, Google Glass on. So that's like my dad. And there was like they had this room. It's like a small room, maybe like the size of my office, but you could go. It was like a map, but it was a 360 map that was built around you. And you could like go anywhere. You could go look at your house, and then you could see everything like around your house. Um, back uh, when, uh, when my other claim to fame picture is, I have a picture of me carrying one of the Google cameras when they first started rolling out maps. You know, the big uh, backrest with the bulb above your head. I got that picture. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But I also, what was cool was way back then, they thought it was pretty neat that in the in the initial lobby there was a screen that was showing in real time the search queries. And they look very much like the Matrix, you know. But the thing you notice, you look and say, that's a lot of porn requests. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that's what people use mostly the internet back then. Not now, of course, but, you know, back then, porn was a big thing. And, you know, now it's like, no, there's websites for that stuff. Uh, <laughs> but it was kind of neat for that. And then, uh, of course, the thing I thought was fascinating was in all of the buildings, all the walls had those whiteboards on them. Yeah. And people would, they, they would, they, they would talk about this. They put their problems up just for people to walk by and see. And, and they, they, some people go and look, oh, and they just would change something or add something to it and it might solve the problem. I thought that was brilliant back then. It's still brilliant, but I just like, they were the first to have done that kind of stuff. I'm like, you were so cool. Now, and then, of course, the game rooms and all the other stuff. But when I, the last time a I was there. Little bikes on campus you can take around to different buildings. You can like, go take these little bikes on site. And you're like, oh. Yeah, yeah. very colorful <laughs> bikes, I might add. They're kind of like, ooh, can't lose that one in the crowd. <laughs> but it, it's funny because I was talking to one of the guys that was doing the last show. I was there, I don't know, three years ago or something. Of course, for those who don't know, is that when you're there, they, they offer laundry services. The rest, the, the cafeteria is freaking off the chart. <laughs> there's, a, there's a dental <laughs> office there. Hmm? There was a dental office on campus. So, and at first you think, how amazing is that that they're offering all this? And the guy was, you know, after a while of talking with him, he's like, yeah, that's just a prison. I'm like, what? He says, yeah. because <laughs> They just if, don't want you to ever go home. Right. Because if yeah. you're there and you can get stuff done, then you don't need to go home and interrupt your work cycle. And he says, you know, everyone comes relying on because it's so hard to find places to live in the area anyway, that because of that, you, 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 uh, you know, you stay there all the time. You know, some people just sleep under their desk kind of thing. You know, <laughs> that service. Did you I, yeah. did you just ask her for more coffee? Yeah, that was that was my Uber driver. And uh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I'm go OK, yeah. I'm going to call her up after this. Yeah, say, right? You know what you were told you were on the show? <laughs> my Uber East. Little nectar oh. of the gods. <laughs> oh, gods. Uh, anywho. Um, OK, before, just since we're talking about frivolous fun things for just a moment. Uh, what about Robert's stat that he threw out on our little uh, chat dialogue? The uh, the freaking digital time spent thing? What did he say? It was, um, okay, eMarket reported in 2020, U.S. adults spent seven hours and 50 minutes daily consuming digital media. 
it, compared it, to six hours and 49 minutes in 2019, which is still just, it, it's a 15 percent That's just, wow. You know what I'm saying? It's like almost eight hours a day, you're in front of this stuff. But does that break it down? I don't know. No. He didn't share an article where that. Yeah, he sent the link over. Uh, let me see. Well, you know, we spent the games that we have it. <laughs> like, how much of that is work? I mean, if you think about how much time I spent sitting at work, does that count? Um, is that I guess it probably does because it's counting for the time. They probably asked the question directly, but no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna pull Netflix, it up. Netflix, YouTube, maybe. Hulu, Amazon, Disney. They're showing some particular stats. Here, I'm just going to take the whole link. Sorry for the UTM string. It just it's easier hack for me just to copy and paste it than it is to mm -hmm. scrub that off real quick. So they're just going to get erroneous uh, traffic tracking. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look at all these people who looked at it all at once. Right. <laughs> Out of one we had a great article. But it's just it's it's incredible because I guess we're probably going to have to make the designation between watching entertainment computer stuff like Netflix and Hulu stuff. Compared to internet, yeah, the 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 what I'm doing on the computer stuff because watching Hulu to me is not watching computer. That's just the medium of of, of uh, availability for this stuff now. You know, before it was broadcast TV, it's still broadcast TV, but it's now just basic internet. Well, it does break out. So it breaks out social network time. So of that time one hour and five minutes is social networking. And then it breaks it down between Facebook, Insta, Snapchat, TikTok, and Twitter. Dang. And Facebook What's TikTok still like? I'm not, I'm not there on that. What is TikTok? What, is they, what are they saying for TikTok? Um, it looks like TikTok, Snapchat are about the same in recent years, aligned with Twitter. Facebook still is um, much higher proportionate than I thought it would be. Mm. Well, Given that, I mean, if you think about it logistically, we were limited in our uh, our personal interactions, obviously. And so then now you had to find other mediums. And unless you were calling somebody on the phone, which for some generations is not the first choice option for people, or um, you, you got on Zoom or some meeting, which was a little bit more structured, like, okay, I'll, I'll call you on Zoom or whatever, and I'll talk to you on the screen. Facebook was probably the most contiguous medium of like, okay, I can always throw something at them on Facebook and they're going to get back to me eventually and or see it or whatever, or message people when they want to share stuff and things like that. So I can see where Facebook would probably maintain, because we talked about this earlier in the show in the early part of last year, Facebook went up, they were declining in, in, in uh, signups uh, towards the November of 19. And then they started picking up and then went way big at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic first hit. So Facebook saw that surge of, okay, we got to find some way of communicating with people still. So I'm going to go back on Facebook and start talking to people or sign up with it. So we did see that in, in that traffic. So image, I'm going to load, load your image for that. I'm, oh yeah. I'm always yeah. amazed with my, my iPhone on Sunday morning, it sends me a notification that says you spent on average this number amount of time per day on your phone. And every time I see that, I look at that, I'm like, no way, you gotta be kidding. And yet week after week, I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> hey Adele. Yeah. I, I spend even more than they say, because at night I have a, a speaker in my pillow and I let it whisper me sweet nothings while I sleep. So in case I get wake up, my mind doesn't take over. I can just listen to somebody else. Okay. And I have a new mission in life. I'm going to hack your phone and just be subliminal messaging you all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been yeah. listening to um, Dan Cockerell, uh, the Disney guy, on uh, on on his podcast lately. It's it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> My wife, I bought but her. But I'm I looking for. I, I, maybe I'll start listening to the um, to your podcast instead. <laughs> See, yes, yes. Um, I bought uh, my wife a, a headband that has the little earbuds in it, think in Bluetooth, so that she could be resting comfortably to watch. She'll wake up and what puts her to sleep is either like the TV in the background or something. And um, she hasn't used them yet. I'm like, why? She's got really, you know, I'm like, okay, well, that's one present that worked out really well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bought it with the headband. And I took it off the headband because it gives me uh, uh, night sweats and, and hot flashes. Uh, and I just put it in the in the pillow, the, the little, little flat speaker in the pillow. Oh, That's I was about to say, do you like purple? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, but yeah, I just I found it amazing the consumption of, of everything. That, and I guess I do think that they're probably going to have to make the segmentation of entertainment viewing because Hulu and Netflix and everything has changed so much to what they used to call cord cutters. But now it's not cord cutters. Anymore. It's just literally the medium of choice. You local broadcast and, and cable is just not really there anymore. Uh, I mean, it is, but it's not what everyone goes to. That's not the thing. Like, oh, when you move into a house, you're going to go hook up your cable. A lot of people are just worried about getting the internet hooked up. And yeah. from there, that's, that's right. when they determine what they're going to do for, for their entertainment medium. Um, that being said, from an OTT perspective, did anybody see that Vimeo just released their OTT programming for advertisement? I'm on the beta. I'm not really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's No surprise. Yeah, well, sitting on the doorstep of their company office does have benefits. Please let me in. Please let me in. <laughs> I'll buy you coffee. Um, yeah, it, it uh, it's pretty neat because I really think, given the the saturation of some channels right now, like social media and so forth, and the potential first party third party cookie stuff that we're dealing with and everything. OTT is probably going to be our strongest suit because it doesn't need to worry about first and third party cookies. You're literally taking first party cookie information of viewership and using that to target them. So you're using the platform people have already chosen to interact with. And from that, you're able to designate what you want to put in front of them. So it, 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 it's not a circumnavigation. It's just a it's already built like that. So what it's not OTT really stand for over the top. Oh, <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. Really, honestly, I have, to me, I thought they would be a lot more technical, like, you know, transitory electronic transmission, something it was like, no, it's, not, it's just over the top. It's it's the ability to advertise on these channels like uh, Google TV. Um, or, excuse me, YouTube TV, excuse me, I think oh, Google TV, because I call it that, but YouTube TV, um, ATTV Now, uh, Sling, uh, even Netflix and Hulu and stuff. Hulu has a beta that I was in and out of. They were so nice. They got me started on it, and then they said, "I'm sorry, but we now we qualify that in a minimum of ten thousand dollars be spent until we, you know, we broaden the campaign. We have to spend your kind of like, you know, you know." Anyway, so that was just me. Um, but the uh, those channels, when you watch them, when you watch a show, there's sometimes there'll be a commercial, and then there'll be a gap going. Uh, this Zen moment brought to you by you know, or commercial in progress, and it just plays this repetitive music. Those are slots that you can buy and they're really affordable. I mean, like really affordable in the world of like, you know, hundreds of dollars kind of thing or sometimes less, depending upon what you're advertising for. And you can very much target them, not just ge geographically, but demographically, not just who happens to be watching the show, but you choose demographically what you want people to be represented in. And it chooses the shows and the times of day that they know those types of people are watching uh, at what time. And it's really cool. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it right now because right now I think it's a matter not of targeting the demand of some people as it is just making them aware that they should come to your destination. I think it, everyone's got to kind of notch up their their perspective of, com of conversation. It's not about here's our room and rate and dates and here's our amenity basis and all that stuff. It's more like come here instead of there because everybody wants to go somewhere. Yeah. What's the targeting right? like on the back end? I mean, how – like. Have you gotten that deep into it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the well, no, not for Vimeo yet. I mean, I'm on it, but it's it's just I got the account created and I haven't actually run a campaign on it yet. It's just built and they're approving it. Um, but the when I was with Hulu, um, pretty much it was very similar to um, if you've done Twitter because they ask different questions than Facebook, music genres, uh, uh, types of movie uh, genres, you know, action adventure. Uh, romantic. They, they, there's those kind of categories of information as well. And then also demographics, age, uh, genders, ethnicities, if you're interested, geographies, uh, time of days, you can pick all these types of things. And of course, it modifies the bidding process if you're looking for prime time versus off time. Uh, demographics for high density markets obviously have to, you know, they, they, they calculate audiences based on the geographies as well. And that creates your bid cycle. And it's pretty much after that, the same as what everyone's familiar with, you know, budget and bid. And now what so you what, want to write. What, what are your KPIs on that? Because obviously you can't measure clicks on it. In that, well, with one exception, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back <laughs> to that. Uh, there's one exception that comes to mind. But is it primarily eyeballs, impressions that you're, that you're measuring as your exposure? What we had done, uh, two things. One is I know you're going to think about QR codes. I have not exactly. used QR codes yet. Okay. I, I am going to, but I haven't yet. 
Because to me, that is a cool, easy way of doing it. And I'm seeing it more and more in local advertising anyway. What we did was we offered a special promotion by name. So if they went okay. to where we said for them to go, look for a promotion, whatever it was. Yeah, promo and that way we would know that that was that purpose, that, that okay. they went to that promotion. That was the only market channel we had put that promotion name in. Yeah. So any traffic related to that promotion was related to that campaign um, for that. But yes, and, and QR codes, I think, is going to be a much... As people get more and more used to that, because I'm seeing local news now, rather than mm -hmm. telling people to go like these local news places, oh, download our app. They just put a QR code up. They don't even try to tell you the link anymore. It's just scan this and download the app. Just like what like we talked about, Dean, when we're in China. Yeah. That's what we saw all the time. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's a QR code for everything. Scan it, do it. You know, let's not yeah. worry about the Bitleys. So. It's remarkably easy. Yeah, yeah I think... I think it's just, uh, I thought it was going to grow before and then it, it, it fizzled, but I really think that we're not going to go back to not embracing the uh, the QR code. Now that people have tried it and seen how easy it is with menus, they're yeah. going to move to other things. All I know what is I can't make a QR code in the sky with my window What are people you seeing? Fast forward through the ads. What's that? What are you going to do about, I mean, there's always the, like, I mean, I fast forward through every ad that I can, unless if it's record, on. Yeah. Some platforms allow it. Yeah, some, some platforms don't. Like Google yeah, like TV, YouTube, Google, TV, I think there's YouTube TV things. doesn't allow you to push. Yeah. Uh, Prime doesn't allow you to push. Um, Sling doesn't allow you to push. They're, they they don't allow you to push through the ad. Or if you try to push through the ad, it just goes back to the ad and runs it before you go to wherever you're going to forward. So it, it, but for those, and I haven't seen this yet. But what I've been understanding and what they've been talking about in the dialogue is if you choose platforms and or services that allow push through the commercials, your bid price cost goes down because you may get the lesser exposure. I, but I don't I haven't experienced it yet to know if that's the case. I haven't built an ad on something that has that uh, capability yet. All the ads I've built are on platforms that they make you go through the ad. What have you so, seen as your engagement rate? And there's how many? Uh, how many engagements have you had? People that have, I don't want to call it a click, that's not the right word, but they've gone to that promo page that you were talking about. And how much traffic have you seen versus impressions? For the one for the one campaign that we ran through this entire cycle, we were in the double digit conversions. Oh, honestly. okay. Now that's interesting. So, yeah, we were in, I mean, in the teens. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't in the 20s or anything, like that, but it was in the teens yeah. of people that from viewership to action were in the yeah. teens in, 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 in engagement. And there's yeah. always things that you cannot track because they're they're not necessarily going to go directly to it, but it, it still entered their brain and, and now they know about it. Yeah, so. and, and and that's what we learned from it. To be honest with you, Adele, good point is that it wasn't so much about the actual direct conversion. I mean, that was just traffic too. Okay, mm -hmm. but what it did do was create increased traffic that we saw our traffic numbers go up for the site. Hence, our conversions to the site were improved because of it. I don't think necessarily that package because we, I mean we sold stuff, but it wasn't like oh my god that's amazing. This is, but it sold the place like it brought awareness to it. That's why I say that I think from right now the current perspective, destination awareness, value proposition of travel is a stronger play for the audience conversation with it rather than saying buy now, click here, get this, buy this. It's not really that kind of uh, direct action medium. It's more of a Hey, we want you to make aware of this. We want to show you this. We want to give you this. We want to make you uh, get more information, whatever. Come here. And then from there, you can solicit them into a direct conversion. Interesting. Yeah. You, you know what? When we were doing the Adrian Awards, I remember hearing some stories about hotels that were cutting back on, on didn't have the money to do the television. And they found that podcasts was a phenomenal alternative that they could track the results and, mm -hmm. and see a great return. Yeah, podcasts, I mean, definitely destination. We can get to that because I have a comment about that too. Mm -hmm. Dean, you're going to say something. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just, you know, just again, thinking about some of the consumer behavior that we're seeing right now. And, and what you were just talking about, that video and that engagement is a really good example of that because what that's telling me there, again, is that there, there's that interest. We, we talk a lot about our pent up demand and things like that. That's an indicator right there. That's a solid indicator that there's interest, right? They're thinking about it. And I, I like it. I was doing an experiment actually with a, a little property down in St. Lucia. 
uh, where I was running some Google promoted property ads. Okay. By the way, if you Google hotels in St. Lucia, it'll Google will tell you very matter of factly that there is a two week quarantine requirement on both in and out of that. Right. So it's not an easy place to travel to right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so conversions, bookings aren't what you're going to get. Yeah. But I was very impressed by the fact that I was getting a 10% click through rate on these promoted properties ads. And I thought, oh my, why on the world? Well, it's because people are curious, which then led me to another question that I haven't been able to test. With a promoted property ad, it automatically, like a MetaSearch ad, clicks into the booking engine screen, right? With the rates and availability. Okay, that's beautiful. But backtrack to that part we just talked about where you really can't book the property right now. Yes, they've got rooms open, they've got availability, but nobody's going there. And I thought about that, I thought, you know, I almost would rather have this go to the hotel website than the booking engine. Because right now that I'm in that dreamer slash driving intent stage, right? I want them to come there and look at the pretty pictures, learn about the, the, the chocolate is a big deal in St. Lucian, if you don't know that. Learn about the chocolate manufacturing, or chocolate, I think is the proper pronunciation, uh, and all that stuff and get them more engaged. I almost think that's a better experience for the consumer than taking them to a booking engine. And I was just curious what you thought on that. I totally agree. I I always felt that way that they're, you know, once they're curious, they're not ready to put the money down yeah. until they've explored, you know, all that we have to offer. But sometimes you can have a uh, a page where you you have more pictures and you have more content like the website, but there's also maybe a calendar underneath it. Which is yeah, which is because book yes, of course we want bookings, and I'm never going to say we don't want bookings, but bookings aren't what's happening right now for that type of property. And again, this is very specific to a certain type of property, a Caribbean resort destination, and so on, where you can't hardly go there. So right now, I'm not so much focused on getting your booking, but I'm focused on getting you right, getting your eyeballs, and getting by the way, getting the first party cookie, and getting all that kind of stuff to my site. I don't know, something about, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I'm stuck in St. Lucia for a month because it takes two weeks to be there. Who knew, I want right? to stay there for two weeks and it's two weeks to come back. So call me later. Um, <laughs> go ahead. But you know what? Uh, now Grenada has made it a 48-hour uh, cutoff because you, you've had the vaccine. You've had your negative test on the American side. Once you get there, you get a rapid test. You have an answer 48 hours later, and and you're welcome to you know be free and do whatever you want after that. Mm. So I think that there, I think that more places in the Caribbean are, are going to follow. Yeah, I think that's probably. It. I don't want to lose track of what you mentioned with podcasts, Adele, because we don't do podcasts that are destination specific. We do things about what the context of what we like talking about, but. I, uh, I tried and, and and I still think that there's a huge opportunity for this of destinations doing podcasts on a regular basis, whether it's every couple of weeks, every week, maybe even just every month for that matter. It doesn't really have to be one of those. I got to sign up all the time things. Um, but talking about their destination, things that are coming up, things that they should be that people should be aware of. I, I, I think it's a missed opportunity for some places as people are looking to discover where they're going to. Okay, this is going to sound really crude, but it's not meant to be this way. Lose their virginity and travel. Uh, <laughs> because in all honesty, you know, they're going to a place that they haven't gone anywhere for a long time. And mm -hmm. so they're really built up this, where am I going to go? And it's yeah. got to be that. It's got to be all that they want it to be. They've, they've, they've tallied their monies. They've tallied their dis you know discoveries. They've tallied their education process. They're looking to go to that place. And they don't want to miss anything. They want it to be everything they wanted it to be. So having this ability to communicate in a real-time way things that are happening in a window of time can help that process. I mean, I'd much rather go to a place that I knew everything was there that I wanted to do and did everything I wanted to do when I got there because I was aware of it than to go to a place that I didn't know what I, I wanted to do, missed what I probably would want to have done, and left not knowing that I missed it. I wonder if Stuart will be the first uh, destination. Uh, hey, you company. never know, right? Stuart might be the first to <laughs> call the Myrtle Beach podcast. But but <laughs> and the other is, and this goes to a platform that we do every week anyway, Monday through Thursday at the Clubhouse. Why isn't somebody doing something like that on Clubhouse? Just hey, let's talk about coming to Indianapolis or coming to 
and just have something fun like that. It doesn't there, have to be every day. Are, I've listened. I've listened to quite a few. There's some. Have, been there, like, have, they, I miss, have I missed them? To, like, there's a, like an outdoors Colorado one that I listen to. So there are. Um, yes, those those certainly exist on Clubhouse. Cool, because I mean I know that. Venture uh, outside uh, of your marketing bubble. Yeah. See, yeah, I got to get First out of my just making I fairness, I haven't looked for them either, right? Yeah. I know Stephanie, the other Stephanie, which you, Stephanie, don't come to our thing anymore. <laughs> that one, the one that Ed does is like 6 a.m. my time. So no, 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 no. I'm not about our, the noon one. Ed does his own right. thing on that. That's fine. Ed can do his own thing. I'm talking about the noon one, you know, okay. the happy one, the better one. I think one, I was reading that there was like, uh, something insane like 250,000 more podcasts launched in 2020 but i assume up to the pandemic so i mean i feel like the podcast market is like super saturated right now and i just looked it up because i was curious when i i spoke at a college and they i asked them how they get a lot of their knowledge and like half the students said podcast yeah and i was like it kind of i was like really like i that wasn't the medium that i was expecting and i looked it up and it says by age group, um, in 2020, 49% of the people that listen to podcasts were between 12 and 34 years old, but only 22%, uh, 55 and above. So I think you have to, if you are going in that in that direction with podcasts, you have to also make sure you understand your market and who might be traveling to your destination and making sure that there's... Agree, agree. I also, it makes sense because... Think about progression of polarities of opinion. We create, as you just pointed out with me, our echo bubble. I, I follow people related to what I'm interested in, which is marketing for hospitality, so forth and so on. It's my echo bubble. Um, and I don't look outside of that very often unless there's particular interest. With that going on, there's been pushback from this. You know, I, I see it all the time on Facebook, and it's so disappointing. Somebody makes an opinionated comment on something neutrally, just like just an, and the trolls that attack. Oh, my God. It's like. Ah, you don't know what you're, it's like really seriously. They just, somebody asked for an opinion. Okay. This is how innocuous it was. There was a RV thing that popped up in my mind. Cause you might be interested in this. And somebody asked, Hey, should I put this little widget with this little widget or should this widget be that widget? And these people are like, what are you an idiot? And just like, seriously, the dude's just asking a question. <laughs> and it's like, come on. So I can see where podcasts come into play because you can stay in your echo bubble and not have to deal with the diatribe of an opinion. Somebody can, I mean, uh, to be honest, there's this guy that cleans the pool at the condos that I'm at. He listens to uh, uh, conservative media while he's by the pool. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, what a bunch of, anyway. Uh, right <laughs> but now. that's what he listens to. And that's like, I'm not going to take it away from the, that's his opinion. That's what he wants to listen to. I'm not, you know, <laughs> just turn it down a little bit maybe. But, you know, but the the we all listen to what we're interested in. And podcast is a great medium for that. I mean, look at how powerful it is that Apple's launching a whole new platform about not, you know, non-commercial based podcasts and so forth. It's, it's such a direct channel medium now of communication. So if you believe in something, you find a podcast that reiterates that, or you follow something that is patterned off of what you, uh, you value, you're going to listen to it. It's going to be your medium of choice. I, I, I see that happening, but yes, to your point, there's a huge dilution to it. But also if you look, there's a lot of dead soldiers out there. There's a lot of podcasts that died months ago. You know that there is no new update, there is no new episode, or there's no there's no pattern to it, or whatever. Because I I look at some of my podcasts I subscribe to, and I'm like, last edition was 2017. Ooh, I haven't listened to that one in a while, because they just stopped doing it. That's one of the reasons why consistency is such a huge thing. Is like if you show up, be there. You know, do do the do the thing, project until you're done. So anyway. well, and I don't like the i the iTunes podcast or whatever. That's usually the app that I use, and their search functionality is awful. Sucks. Like <laughs> bad. Unless and you type it exactly right, you get exactly nothing. I was trying to find a <laughs> podcast by Brini Brown for a Castell thing, and it took me like 15 minutes to find this like particular thing. And I was like, why Why does your search suck so bad? Yeah. That's terrible. And you know what? Also, they don't update their graphics. Oh, like yeah. Six months. <laughs> <laughs> Adele's been fighting the Apple beast for months because she wants to update her graphics. <laughs> Quite a good fight. <laughs> oh, David and Goliath. But yeah, it is It is a very slow medium. And it's also a very absolute medium. If you stop the podcast that you have with them, you can't change the name. You can't. It's done. You have to make a new podcast if you're going to do a different name or something. There's certain things in stone that are just built that way for them that once they put it in as that, that's what it is. 
And you can't change um, it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. All right, now that we bashed Apple for a while, hey. <laughs> bashing <laughs> Apple is fine. <laughs> speak. Okay, since we're on the Apple thing, uh, fourteen point five rolled out. Okay, and uh, eleven point three on the uh, on the uh, uh, Big Sur and stuff like this. Has anybody started seeing those little wall uh, warnings that this app uh, gather, gathers the, the following information, or you know, do you give permission for this app to go over and gather the following information? Have you oh, seen is that, that stuff? What that's from. <laughs> well, no, no, specifically, all right, so I, I confess in here. I haven't upgraded yet. I'm, I'm a little bit of a Candy Crush addict, and so, uh, Adam, suddenly Candy Crush, every time I go in it, has to specifically tell me that they may collect my information. Yeah, that's it. That's why. That's what that is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's what Zuckerberg is all in a wad about because he, uh, it, yeah. it, 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 it kind yeah. of exposes what Facebook... The, the thing that I think everyone's discounting is most people don't really care. I mean, they're just like, I'm going to use the app anyway. Click fine. Sure. You want to know where I went over and went to the bathroom? Sure. Go ahead. That's, I'm good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it, that tracking possibility. Psh, okay. For a lot of people. Now, some people will be like, forget it. I'm not going to. And of course, it warns you afterwards. Well, this will limit the ability for us to be personalizing your information. You may get generic ads in spite of uh, targeted ads and or this app may not work to its full functionality. Okay, sure. Um, I like it for one reason, the apps that you have a question mark over your head when you download them, like, where is this app really built? Who's really running this app? What is this app really doing? Why do I really want this app? Because I'm, as you know, from my screen, hold on, let me go over and boast about my dysfunctional screen. I have lots of folders of apps. I constantly try apps. So I will download the latest app from Shinju, China and just see what it does. <laughs> I don't know what they're getting from me, but it's nice to know that at least Apple will go over and say, hey, you know, it's going to take all of this information and, and use it. And then I can make the decision like, yeah, no, it's not worth it for me to do that. That part I like. The the that 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 That's pretty cool with it. I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a trend, although what uh, they say Google and Facebook will also begin to roll out their own versions of disclosure. I don't know. But I do know it affects us from a marketing perspective. It does change functionalities that we can perform in Facebook because it, it most people don't realize that Facebook, almost two thirds of the data that they use for their targeting was not theirs. It was data from partnerships, you know, financial institutions, medical institutions, things that they, they, they neutralize the individuality of the data, but used accumulatively in the process of uh, the data that they use for targeting for their ads. And um, with that disclosure that they now have to do, people ha are now becoming aware of the fact that it's, uh, as, as they pointed out in the news, a dark side to marketing, that this information is being gathered so freely and for free and then we're being, you know, we're having to pay for that uh, available usage. So I don't know how long, long the long, long effects will be, but it will affect us in some way, I guess. With that in mind, uh, are you getting anybody pushback of saying that they don't want to be heavy in on the marketing, that they got enough business or don't want to bother with marketing and just want to, be, to handle the crisis of overwhelming business demand? Somebody has that problem? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a thing. <laughs> For a lot of our hotels, they're seeing the demand on the weekends, so we're switching to focusing on weekdays more so. Um, yeah, there's a lot of markets that I don't think have any problems on the weekends. More Now it's more like how are you maximizing your ADR and your um, rate strategy and filtering out the lower tiered business on the weekends that we were happy to take six months ago and shifting to say, you know, can we – do more length of stay promos to help with Sundays and Thursdays, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. I, I, I think right now what I'm getting from some client, one, one is I have one client in particular uh, on the beach front property. Go and said, Lauren, I love talking to you. I'm just shoving everything across the table to you. You do whatever you need to do, whatever way you need to do it, make the decisions you want to do and tell me how much it is and I'll write a check for it. I don't care. And I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I went over and it's like, okay, fine. He says, I have no time for this. I, I'm more worried about whether I got crew showing up to handle what a business I got than I have anything. Hey, Melissa! Uh, then, then I, I do for... For, for anything else, he's, you know, marketing wise, he says, I'm not worried about it. But he also in the same vein says, look, I need help. I need advertising for staff, team. I need them now. I need you to. And I thought it's a very smart move that he realized that marketing has that ability. We had that discussion on, on uh, 
um, Clubhouse. Yeah. Clubhouse yesterday. We yeah. talked about that where it was uh, utilizing the resources like marketing for HR because HR isn't in the world of advertising. They don't. I mean, they they'll take applicants. They'll de, you know define the job role and all the other stuff they're supposed to do. But they're not, other than just oh go let's go to LinkedIn and put an ad up, which is like white noise at this point. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really have a means of isolating, targeting, and soliciting people to come to their team. So Melissa, thank you. It's good to see you. Happy to <laughs> everyone. I, obviously, we have a well balanced crew. We have three women, two guys, which is great because that means we have an intelligent dialogue today. <laughs> <laughs> Excluding Dean and I. That's what I'm just saying. <laughs> Wait, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, I Melissa. Just like how, I just don't like how Facebook, when you're looking for line level, that you can't force them to, you can't put a link in to have them apply on your own website. You either have them apply for Facebook or you have to put an email address in, which Lead basically drive. calls double work for, yep. you know, Lead anybody drive. receiving that. And that, that's like my one big, like, angry thing to Facebook is you need to, I need to be able to drop a link in, not just an email address. Yeah. Application. I, uh, uh, two things to that one with two go arounds I've done. One is I've used bots on the website to go over and solicit people going over and saying, Hey, are you looking for an op excellent career opportunity with us potentially? And it's a separate bot and it goes through a whole dialogue with them. What are you interested in doing? What, what you know, what it, it goes through and pre-qualifies them a little bit and gives them the opportunity to just simply put in their base information for communication. We don't try to push them over to a form or fill out this application. We just want to make an established communication with them. And the other is we're doing the same thing for um, the messenger. We put that into our logic stream. Uh, for any reason, if you're looking for uh, career opportunities with us, please click here. And it goes off to a separate logic string for them uh, to communicate with us. Just because of what you just said, it's either a lead gen. Hey, you're interested in working with us? Click here and, and then put in your Facebook information. A lot of people don't want to share their social contact information in something like that. So it's kind of a self-defeating thing. You know, like I don't want you to have my Facebook connection to want a job. I just want you to call or me call you or give you a link to go to app of apply or something. Which also, ooh, ooh, another little thing we're trying. I haven't found out yet for this yet is video interview. We're putting a link with Dub, which is a platform I use. For people to video ask for, hey, I'm looking for a position on such and such. I've done such and such. I've done such and such. And just send the video over. Just, hey, I'm interested. And it's a little video thing. We're just trying it. We just started this week. Well, earlier this week. So we'll what see. What was that called? What was that Dub, D-U-B-B. -B. All right. I've heard of that. That sounds somewhere. great. Because it's you kind of fun. It's, it's just a little link thing person. that they can click on it and just do a, hey, I'm interested in such and such or whatever, you know. But but so I, I don't know yet. You have to show up for the interview or show up for the job. Right? I mean, I have, I'm, yeah, they're, 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 the, lo the local news here, there's restaurants that are giving 50 bucks if you show up for the interview. Whether they you get the job or not, they're giving you 50 <laughs> bucks to show up for the interview. Because well, they're, they're saying that people don't even show up. You know, you if know you plan what? that out just right, schedule one interview an hour. I'm thinking it's like Yeah, I always want to be a server. <laughs> <laughs> My friend that was doing a, a career, you know, an event, hiring event for 10 hotels in the um, – in the DC area. So they had over 300 people show interest. And then she sent them all a link to like reserve their slot for social distancing. Only like 105 wow. of the 300 even would reserve a slot. And of those, guess how many showed up for the actual interview? How many? Five. Get the hell out. Seven. Really? Seven, Seven out of 300, out of of 315 wow. or something like that. Wow. 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 So I mean, show up, you got pretty good odds. Yeah. <laughs> the odds are in your favor. Here's a mirror. Can you fog it? Good. You've got the job. <laughs> that's sad. Wow. I mean, that's wow, just... that's like a bad agency conversion campaign right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But it is, it is. I mean, we're seeing it in the news all the time. I mean, uh, they're talking about the fact that, oh, like l lumber. Okay. I'm, I'm and our condos, the reason why it's in my head is that the condo association has uh, contracted out for the stairs to the second floor of condos, not mine, uh, get replaced. The price went from here to like here. Mm -hmm. I mean, plywood was $9 a sheet or something six months ago. Now it's $58 or something. If you can even get the wood. And then two by fours, are, uh, they said it was 250% price increase in the past six months for wood. And they said because... Shipping is down. They, they don't have enough truck drivers and they don't have enough 
workers doing stuff. So the supply is low. And so, of course, price goes up. And and they now, of course, the, the, they're looking at trying to salvage some of the wood because they don't, you know, they, they're trying to keep it in the price that they quoted to get it done. And I'm like, well, that wood's rotten there. You might not want to save that piece, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, they're like, oh, no, a little glue and it'll be fine. Um, but it's, it's amazing how the shortage is affecting so many things. And uh, except for Amazon, they hired everybody. <laughs> They took all the workers, but they're saying between the unemployment and then the federal stimulus money between the two, people are having better incomes than they had when they were working or at least the same. So why work until that funding runs out kind of thing is the logic that they're saying. I don't prescribe that that's really the strongest reason. I think it's I a contributing know. reason. Because what, what happens when that funding runs out? Yeah. Yeah. And then just, I think also people... Just me in an esoteric discussion, I think people have come to realize there's more to life than work. I think that people have come to balance out the fact that they do want to go to their child's recital. And it doesn't mean that they're going to lose a rat race at the office by being early to leave the office from the other competitors that are in the same rat race that they're going to be perceived poorly because they left and everyone else worked the extra two hours that day. They realize, you know, screw it. I don't care. I'm going to make sure I go to my daughter's recital or I'm going to do this or I'm going to go from work from home because I can be just as productive. Hell no, we proved that in the past year and a plus and that people are realizing that it's not that. And then for those that have to show up for line positions that, you know, be lucky you have a job mentality or we're going to pay you what we think you're owed, but not what you deserve. Or, you know, we're going to keep you at a, a point where you have to always work overtime because that's the only way you can afford your lifestyle which is base lifestyle. I'm not saying the people buying Maseratis, just the fact that they can afford their, their rent and everything else in the world, you know, that they have to do overtime. Uh, people are going, no, no, that's not, no. I think there's a better way of doing this. And I think that's influencing it too. I think there's people that are doing that as well. And, and for us in hospitality, we've always been, for lack of a better way, abusing that mentality of, no, no, you have to pay your dues. No, you, holidays, out. That's our busiest time, you know. Weekends, pff, that's we, yeah, that's busy time too, you know. Uh, regular nine to five, no, 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 no. We got we got things going on in the evening. We got shifts in the evening, you know. If you want to be in this industry, you know, it's a rewarding industry, but you got to work whenever we need you. You that know, heard, yeah, yeah. When I when I started, they said, oh, you have to pay your dues and you have to do these evening events and you have to come in on the weekends and and do your weekend shifts. And and I bought it and I believed it. And I'll never forget when I had my family coming from Israel and I said, I can't come in on Saturday to be at this event. I, I, I this is a precious moment. They don't come every, you know, all the time. And they said, well, you can bring your cousins with you to the event, but you can't not work the event. And 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 the thing is that so many decades later, I was getting paid, obviously, at a completely different level, but I was still working more hours than anybody if you put it together. Because yeah. so, and and they would leave, be more likely to leave because younger people are more uh, wise to the fact that you know you should you should schedule your fitness class right after work and and get to it, and it is important to make that time for yourself. And I. I still live in that. I've, I've got to do it all. I've got to be in every place at the same I'm time. So, Adele, you lost me at fitness class after work. I don't, it, <laughs> <laughs> that's happy hour. That's happy hour. That's not fitness time. That's happy hour. That's happy hour. <laughs> but you know what? I think that I think that hotels and all businesses are going to have to readjust the way they think about their teams. Um, that that the, we're not going to return back to that old model. I, I just don't think so. Yeah, I think hotels gonna... still need hotels and restaurants still need people to work. Still need people. Yes. Holidays. Yes. 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 I mean, and maybe what? that's where. I mean, I yeah. I did that, and yeah, there's right. a time and a place for it. But I, you know, and you sacrificed I, a lot, and it is, and and I think there will always be a sacrifice of that balancing between there's just needs for, but I think we as an industry are blind eye to making that adaptive change. 
here's my here's my logic of what satisfies you. Steph. I'm of the same old school. It's like, look, I got stripes on my arm of how many years I pulled those shifts. I got I got years of pictures of me and my wife at parties that because I was running it as a food and beverage director, and the only way I got to see her at New Year's was she showed up at the New Year's party. I'm freaking running, okay? So really? I got those pictures, right? I, I, and I want everybody to have that pain that I had, but I got to let it go because it doesn't make a difference. It's like, no, if there's a way as an industry that we can go over and say, look, this is what you get in extra for doing these things that we need, or this has to be incorporated into your scheduling that, yes, we want that balancing act, but there will be times, certain dates of evenings that we need these to happen or holidays that needs to happen. But to create an, an, an equality to this, that allows for the flexibility of if you do this, you get this, whether it's compensation and or alternative time, something. We don't have that built into our structure right now. We have it of pay your dues. I feel like, and I mean, I appreciate the doctors that have learned this way because they must have learned it by rote, but that intern program that they run through, that internship that they run where they're, where they're beaten to death for 18 hours a day or 24 hours a day for five days and then they crash for two days. And, they, and the idea is that if they build it to be an automatic response that they're good even if they're half asleep. I don't buy that anymore. That to me seems ridiculous that you're going to yeah, force Yeah, but them. once you're an actual doctor, you only work like 12 days a month. So. Okay, yes. <laughs> Go, you granted, but most of your workout you is- You just got to get through the pain of residency, okay? So. <laughs> yeah, you paid your dues. We're in that paid your dues in industry where it's like you, you get your stripes. Oh, hey, wow. Well, you think it's, and I actually told and this is really bad because I'm getting really blatant in my older age, I guess. I had a GM that got on a call and it was just him and I. And I had this whole agenda of stuff that I needed to get answered. And he says, dude, I'm working 80 plus hours this week. I'm pulling front desk shit, cleaning rooms, so forth and so on. I says, I'm not going to use his name. You know, nobody cares. He's like, what? Dude, I did the same thing. I used to, I used to say what you just said. I'm pulling 100 hour weeks, this and this. You know what? If you die, the people are going to show up to your funeral and go, hey, he was a great GM. Who's replacing him? And walk right past your grave, dude. They don't care. It's business. So quit sacrificing for people who don't care. And if anything, we had companies that showed this. Oh, we're a family company. We're a great company. We're, we're all about our people. What's that? We're out of business or we're reduced business. Fire everybody. That's what a lot of companies did. And now they're wondering why they can't get people back because they're like, I kind of remember when you were a dick. <laughs> if somebody's working 40, 80 hours a week, that means he needs an assistant manager that works alternate shifts, not, you know, overlapping. If you're working that much, you're not managing well. Not because you're not going to your ownership and saying, I'm overworked or, or I'm not able to be as productive as I want. If you have to work that much to get the work done, you're working too much. Yeah, I know I'm being, I, I can say that from my angle right now. Go ahead, Dean. Sometimes you also have to face the fact, though, too, that, that there are things that just have to get done. Uh, well, you're, you're working in New Year's Eve. Okay. Well, somebody has to do it, right? Look, right. I, grew up, I grew up on a farm in Northeast Nebraska. We had to feed cows. We had to feed and, you know, and do these things. And you had to get up in the morning and do that, whether you liked it or not. It didn't matter. And I can remember very clearly, and this is one of the reasons I'm not a farmer, by the way, is <laughs> it was Christmas Eve. We had just come back from midnight mass. And our tradition was we were kids and we were tradition was back from midnight mass. Santa Claus somehow came while we were there and we got home. That's when we opened presents. We got back from midnight mass and cows were out. So we were putting in cows and rounding them up, putting them in, getting them back in their pen at about two o'clock in the morning, Christmas Eve, uh, you know, because you had to do it. It just had to be done. So you know, you're, you're the, the, the mentality, I respect everything everybody says about that, hey, we have to have that work-life balance, but sometimes it's just shit that has to get done. Not to disagree. Agree. And not to change the subject, but I also feel that way about all the, uh, you know, anybody that's a new entrepreneur that has this like, you know. Always on? Well, no, people that have this, how do I say, you know, like they, they think that, you know, being an entrepreneur and running your own schedule and picking your own clients is some like magical place that they can it isn't? achieve. Whoa, whoa, in a whoa, whoa, what's this? What? <laughs> you know, like, um, and there's a lot of unrealistic expectations about it, what it takes to succeed in the, you know, and do your own thing. So. You Wait know? a minute. I'm, yeah, you're the picture postcard for me. Go Google T-shirt and leisure lifestyle. I'm thinking right? you're at the apex of happy right now. I don't understand what you're trying to say that it's not that. <laughs> no, I. But but I'll say to you to your point, living the life. I mean, I can go over and say these things about overwork and about life balance. I'm not disagreeing with you. There are times where it just needs to get done. I'm what I'm saying is added to that equation of okay, good, you did it. Thank you. Is here's what you get for it. Here's a balance to it. Just a fulcrum of 
if you had to do, if you had to work the New Year's or you had to push the 80 hour week, because God dang, we got slammed, we were unprepared, we don't have enough staff, and you ponied up and you worked those extra hours because it just needed to get done. Great. Don't just marker that and let it fade into the past of what you did. There's a there's a marker that you get rewarded for. Hey, remember that week that you pulled 80 hours or that month that you pulled 80 hours a week? Here's a here's here's a five day vacation to such and such on us. Go take it. Okay. Yeah, but then you're gonna get into the like, well, you did this employees and be like, oh, you did this for that. And when you're talking about like I used to work at 1122 room hotel with 160,000 square feet of space. If I got into that, like I'm gonna reward this person and not this person, I'm gonna have every server lined up at my office every day saying, well, he did this and he got that. I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but that's impossible to do. Closers get donuts, Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, it's, I mean, it's one of those things where, yes, you're right. You create a larger problem by making that a condition of it. But I think we're all smart enough to know how to logistically create a balance for everybody. Here's what I think would also happen. People would line up offering to do extra work if they feel like they're going to get rewarded for it. I think the other balance to what you're saying, too, is where they wouldn't be up like whining as much. That would happen. There's always going to be those. OK, but there's also the people's like, wow, if I do that extra stuff, I get rewarded for that. Sign me up. I'll pull, I'll pull the new year. I'll sign up for every holiday right now because they may be a position in their life where that is not a problem or an issue. And they get something for it. For, case in point, going back to the Google discussion, just because it was something we started with. They were able to bank their vacation or, or their their credits to where they stayed based on what they chose to stay at. So they were given a per diem, and they they could stay wherever they wanted to. If they could, if they wanted to stay at a place that was above the per diem, they could. They paid the difference. If they stayed at a place that was below the per diem, that banked credit for them. Mm. So what they did is when they had to travel for work. You find a lot of Google people that are going into really affordable places because it banked a nice little wad of money that when they went to a place that they thought, ooh, I want to go there and really enjoy it. Plus, I want to add some of my vacation time on top of it. They had this credit that was allowed to them to make sure that they could pay for what was above per diem at that time, plus whatever else they wanted to go beyond. That When you start showing people that they have a means to do it, you will get what you said, Steph. People that will come in and go, why she get it and not me? Well, because she's works her butt off and you don't or whatever it is, you know, candor or whatever. Or the other part of it is where they might come in and go, hey, look, if you're needing people to really do that, where you need that New Year's Eve party and nobody else is volunteering, I'm in because I understand that if I do that, I get this for it. I think people will work that way as well. But yeah, to your point, there will always be whiners. And that's why they- <laughs> whiners. <laughs> well, you also need, I mean, I think that everybody on this podcast has a mindset that's always about, you know, continuous learning and growth and personal growth there. You also have to understand there are those people that just want to come to work and get a paycheck. And you have to be Mm -hmm. able to understand that mindset and be able to appeal to that mindset. I mean, I used to do events where we would have, if we were using every ballroom, I would need, you know, 400 servers. So I, I mean, I'm picking whatever, I mean, I have to take whatever walking bodies can, carry a tray at that point right. in time, you know, like there's, and I don't know, there's, I feel like you have to appeal to the mindset. So maybe not everybody wants X and that that's Gr- a hard granted, part. granted. And I do believe that there are some positions that are what they are. Your temporary banquet staff is an on off switch. It's I need them or I don't need them. And it's not about whether I needed them on a new year's Eve or whether it's, You're available to work. Here's what I have available. You either choose that you can do it or you can't do it. And that's the relationship we have. I'm with you on that. But also going back to that world of, there are people I could lean on as if they were a stone pedestal. I could always count on them to be whatever I needed them to be. They should get rewarded. They should be rewarded for the fact that they were so mainstay in their commitment to making sure that we always do what we needed to get done. I wanted to give them something other than just an attaboy or, a, hey, why don't you take tomorrow off, which you're already going to take anyway. You know, it's just I think that there's a balancing of that kind of system for those that are perpetual with you. There is a criteria of engagement with people. You have part timers. You have those people that are, as you, you know, said, can carry a tray. By the way, claim to fame, 21 plates on one tray. I think I'm like half your size, so that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, okay, fine. (laughs) Without dating myself, which I'm about to do, (laughs) do any of you think that there is a generational issue of what is expected of people when they come to work? Yeah. Oh, by far. So as we're looking at hospitality jobs, 
<laughs> Tamara said yes. 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 <laughs> For starters, I expect you to come to work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> able to work. Able to work. Let's add that in there because that wasn't added in before. Able to work. Not like, all right, I'm here. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So um, yes, uh, at these jobs that require working weekends and holidays and all these things, and these are tend to be more entry level. I'm not saying all of them, but the, the, mm -hmm. the positions we're trying to fill are more entry level. And you have a lot of generational people who just don't oh, yeah. want to do that. I, I, I go back and this even goes back a ways too is uh, if my boss had to come in and help me with my job, I worked doubly hard because it was embarrassing that my, my boss had to come in and help me, uh, you know, whether it be a server or whatever I was doing at the restaurant or whatever. Generationally, another generation, not too far distant, if the boss came in, I came in to go over and help them do stuff, they went and took a smoke break. They're going, hey, you're the boss. If you want to do my work job, I'll just go take a smoke break. Total different perspective. It's like, um, I'm helping you because you're crappy at what you're doing and I'm trying to catch you up and you're just going to take a smoke break? What the hell? You know, it, Perception wise, it, it is very different. I, I remember when I was coming up as a formal server, you didn't have the right to work. You showed up fully tuxed with your dry tag, uh, dry to clean tag sticking out, and you went through inspection to whether you were allowed to get on the floor that night. Seriously, if you didn't, if you had a stain that you didn't take care of, or uh, you weren't dressed in the proper uh, attire as designated. Uh, and you didn't have your dry to clean tags on to show that you clean and pressed your uniform that you had to buy yourself, not, you know, then you weren't allowed on the floor. You didn't make money that night. But if you made money that night, you made some dang good money that night. Because, I mean, that's what if the, that was the carrot is that if you could present yourself, that doesn't exist anymore. That stuff doesn't happen anymore. You know, have you I, sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. No, I was going to ask Melissa at Fuel, have you guys done hiring in the last recently that where you've had to shift your either hiring practices or training to adapt? Yes. Well, we've only had one new hire during the pandemic, but yes. So that person we had started interviewing before the pandemic and had to put things on hold because, you know, we lost a whole bunch of clients, so we couldn't afford to hire anybody, but now we're back on the hiring train. So this person eventually was hired via remote interview and has been trained mostly remote, um, is working remote until right now. Um, she's decided actually to go into the office at least a few days a week, but she's kind of there by herself. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's not the same as having our team all together. We don't have that camaraderie that we normally mm -hmm. would if we were in person. It's not the same. I'm not gonna lie and say that it is. Right. Yeah, it is. It is definitely different in that sense. And I think going to what you mentioned earlier, Steph, we as us have a certain luxury that a lot of people don't have. We can do this. We can be on a screen and get work accomplished. We can meet with people that we need to meet with for what we do, and we can still function in our job descriptions. Somebody on a line level, front desk is front desk. Housekeeping is housekeeping. Engineering is still engineering. Uh, staff, line staff don't have that luxury. They have to balance the capabilities of getting to and from work, all the restrictions municipality-wise that have to go through, the, 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 the constant changes that management create. From that, uh, going back to that balancing of life thing, how I think that it influences them is we, if anything, show a disparity between those that are on top versus those that are on the bottom. CEO uh, salaries compared to line positions are measured in the the geometric proportion of percentage overages of what they get paid in comparison to what their, their line people get paid. So what I'm asking about is literally taking what's already existing in the finances of a company and reassessing it to balancing out to the proportion that is necessary to make people feel that they're being a part of what they're producing as much as the people that are running it that get it to be produced. And so it may mean a salary reduction for somebody in a higher level. It may mean a, a different margin for profitability, uh, for ownership, but not to take it away from everybody. It's like, this isn't a, a socialist thing to say, oh, everybody should just make what they need to make for their lifestyle. I'm not saying that. Success should be rewarded. Performance should be re re rewarded. I'm just saying that there should be a reassessment as to how we pay for people. I mean, not to pick on Walmart, but the fact of it is, is that 
uh, you know, most of the people that work at Walmart had to go over and get subsidized income from the government just to maintain poverty level. And for companies, in my mind, it's an embarrassment that they're arguing about $15 an hour because congratulations, you just announced that you're paying people below poverty level. It's, a, it's amazing that people's perception of if they don't know what it's like to live at those levels, they don't know what they're asking people to do for so what little they're able to compensate them for. So when it comes to what you talk about, Adele, and so forth, culture and creation and guest sensitivity and guest focus and so forth, if the person's hungry, they're not really as focused as they could be. If they're wondering whether they're going to pay their rent, they're not as focused as they could be. Sustaining the value of what they do for us is something we as an industry really haven't tackled as strongly as we should. And now we're facing that because we're just not getting the people in to work with us at that point. From a line level position, I should say. You Stephanie, know, you're getting your post. Holy crap! Are you kidding me? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Dale. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. So on on the podcast, on my podcast, the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast, uh, just posted was a conversation with Christine Trippi. She years ago uh, took over as general manager for a. Marriott Courtyard that was in the red zone on Marriott, you know, failing to meet the basic standards of guest satisfaction that are required. And everybody said that um, she's going to have to let, you know, a lot of people go, that the people didn't care. And she went in there and maybe maybe one or two people at the top had to change, but everybody else turned into absolute superstars once when when she said i have a vision for this company we're going to be the best we're we're going to not worry about things that we cannot change like it's an older building or that we have a lot of competition around us or whatever we're not going to worry about what we can't change we're going to focus 100 percent on the things that we can control and one of those things is the culture, the cleanliness, uh, the service or friendliness, etc. And they did. And then they became the number one hotel on TripAdvisor for their for Lake County in uh, in Illinois. And and she did it with the same people. And she and I agree. I, I hope everybody will listen to that podcast episode because it is a good one. But I but she and I agree that you you may imagine that those people are coming in and 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 clocking in and doing their job and leaving and that's all they care about that's all that they care about now because they have to stone their feelings to to manage to get through a job where it doesn't show that they appreciate them but when you start treating those people with respect and saying I know you guys are great. I've seen you do great things. I just want you to do great things every day, all the time, and everything you do. And I know you've got it in you, and I'm going to help you every step of the way. When you do that, you change somebody's life. You take them from being somebody who is painfully just struggling to do the tasks that are before them and they're not building a cathedral they're just building a brick wall but if you tell them that you're building a cathedral which in in hospitality terms means we're here to you know provide comfort and respite and and hospitality to everybody who walks through our doors we're going to be met with smiles and great thanks and we're going to do something wonderful to put a little sunshine into these people's lives every one single one of the person that walks through our door needs this break and this this hospitality from us and we're going to change the world by what we give to them and how they leave better than that how they how they came that's actually is by the way uh virgin hotel says that they're uh, you know, their, their, their mission is that everyone who comes in contact with them, whether they're a vendor or an employee or uh, a guest leaves better than when they came. That's, that should be a universal feeling. The, the people's lives change when that happens and they have to start believing that they're worth something and that they have a future and they have the potential to grow. And you know what? It's wonderful to see somebody who used to be in housekeeping become the general manager of a hotel. 
it, or started as a bellman or started as a dishwasher or started as a busboy. The owner of the library hotel collection started as a busboy. So it can happen. So don't treat people. It's not just what we pay people. It's what we pay them because we think little of them. But we pay them little when we think little of them. We have to pay them what we, what for their potential and all that they're going to bring to the table because we cannot have a hospitality business without them. True. I'm I, 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 I don't want to, like, I believe in everything you say. And I, I believe wholeheartedly in culture because I've been in bad cultures and I appreciate culture more, I think, once you've been in a bad one previously. But right. I, back back to what Melissa's saying, I and I've um, hired a few people during the, the pandemic and I've struggled with like millennials needing different, like just patting them on the back and like pay, publishing your vision, like those things don't always work the same way. Right. And being able to s communicate with them differently because they have different value sets. So like making sure that you, you know, communicate your values in the hiring process, but in that carries through in your culture, it's, it's easy to say, it's a really hard thing to actually do. Yes. And I have found that millennial or just, you know, just young, like I've been working with it through an internship with the local college and having an intern, like I, it's, it's been a struggle for me. Cause I'm like, why well, I just need you to like, where's the initiative? Like there's like these intangible things that I really struggle with that, have nothing to do that, you know, like, like I said, Adele, everything you said is true, but there, there is a different mindset and different expectations that you, ha that I have, that I'm sure I have been struggling with. I don't know if that's where you were going with that, Melissa. I have, I have felt that myself. I just want you to know that just because I say that doesn't mean I have <laughs> yeah. because I, I have, but I can tell you, I've, I've had millennials that have been absolutely powerhouses. And then I've had others where they'll tell me, you know, Adele, you're supposed to, um, I don't know if you know about this, but you're supposed to uh, say something nice and then say the criticism and then say something nice. But I would be like not being able to come up with one thing nice I could say. <laughs> well, I, just want to, so I, I need to goal. clarify that I'm technically a millennial. I was born in 81. So I just want to, I'm not saying anything bad about millennials because technically, technically I am one and I don't, what's after millennials? Gen something. I forget the mom mix up. Gen Z. Yeah. And to, then. To, to bring things in, and Tamar brought up a very good point of this, is that there is a contrast between, I think, I mean, I don't have the answers to all this. I have definitely opinions about it, but I think two things I've found from being in different cultures where you have an active engaged team at a property level like I've had and then I have an office engaged team like I've had I've been in a corporate office team engagement I've been in lots of different tiered engagements of what's considered culture and team and I think from two things I think that we can learn from this from regardless of the generational differences of busting your butt 80 hours a week because that's what you thought you're supposed to do to the where's my la cafe lappuccino coffee with frothy cream topping that I was told I was going to hit every day when I walked in the door. There's a there's a, a qualifier of expectations that goes through communication, for instance, and I'll bring this to some realities. People that get hired in certain offices require or expected swag bags. Um, I thought it was a benefit bonus where somebody sh joined the team. We put a little T-shirt in their QB that they were going to be sitting in, and we put a little cu a cup that had the logo on it and their welcoming card and their welcoming goodies and all the stuff that we thought were welcome to the team. I remember the first person that came back to me going, I only get one T-shirt? Whoa, dude, you got one. What the f <laughs> You know, like, where is that from? And it came from the fact we didn't quantify what they were interested in doing when they came. And I went through talking to the people that interviewed them. This is before I got engaged with the interview process as much as I ended up doing. And I found out that they didn't ask some of these questions. What do you, why do you want this? What, 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 do you, what do you want to do? What is your expectations of this? The swag bags I, I found out from a generational perspective is a bragging point. Look what they gave me. Look at this. I'm so, you know, they, they, they do this in the social engagement, just like when we used to, when social first came around, people were taking pictures of what they're eating and stuff. Look what I'm eating. Look what you're eating. Look what I'm eating. There, it's a show off. It's all about me, my branding, what I do. And I found out this goes back a few years, you know, six years, seven years, whatever, that the swag bag that was offered to them was a uh, bragging right between them and their peers as to who got what in comparison to what they got. I didn't know that because I didn't ask that. It's the point I'm trying to make. I didn't ask what I thought I was doing something nice 
by giving them some neat little things to welcome them to the place. I didn't know it was a branding badge of whether or not we really want to kiss their ass, but for coming in. And so I learned that. So I asked that now in the interview. So how do you think about swag bags? Well, you know, I love showing up. I, okay, so if you didn't get one, what did that would mean? What would that mean to you? And I would listen and watch them. And even though they may have been technically talented, I didn't think they fit my culture because they were they were focusing on things that I didn't find important to why I was bringing them on board. By the same token, I totally threw out the annual review process because I found historically for me it was a very biased, unfortunately inaccurate way of assessing somebody. Take that same 80 hours a week person and they busted their butt 11 and a half months out of the year and then something stumbled. And the last two weeks before their, their, their review, something went wrong or something went weird or they did something wrong, or whatever. And that is front and center in my mind, disproportionately larger than all the other work that they did. And I penalized them by not rewarding them as much for all the things that they did do. So we created this perpetual reward system. And we did it from a peer perspective where people could acknowledge other people, but we diluted it with the fact of, I know your friends. So all the ones you go over and give them little bonus points for, I throw them away. So stop doing it. You know, I, I, I was very clear. And sometimes the clarity of honesty clears up the for a lot of people because they un people want to know what's expected. This is what I expect. This is where I say you've done well. This is where I say you haven't done well. And then to Dal Point, who just left us, is I don't really put a coding around it. It's like I'm not here to say, oh, I love your hair. By the way, you suck. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> there is a neat little application out there. When I worked at Derby Software, we used this called Bonusly. And what mm -hmm. it amounts to is every employee is allotted X number of points, let's say 40 points, that you have that you can then allocate and give out to your coworkers. Uh, that, hey, Lauren helped me get this client on boarded. Lauren, here's 10 points, whatever, right? And then you collect those points as an employee and you can then later use them towards a Starbucks gift card or whatever you want to put in there. There's stuff you could buy with them. That was a really cool application. Yeah, seven geese is like that too. They're, they're the same. And so, and also the, the bonus programs or the compensation programs were not annualized or even quartered or semi-annual. It was, I can't lose you. I got to give you more money. That's plain and simple. You just crushed it. And I need to make sure that you don't go somewhere because you crushed it. And I want to keep you around and keep crushing and doing some stuff. You know, I think we work in our own modalities. And what I just said about the annualization of reviews and so forth, it was an arduous task for any supervisor or managers to go through the annual review process. Ah, it's Susie from housekeeping. I've talked to Susie all of three times, my bad, this entire year. I don't know what Susie does. I know she's in housekeeping. What do other people say about Susie? I don't have anything here. What does HR say? The HR doesn't know that. They're not involved in everybody's dialogue per day basis. They're not a person in their kind of thing. They're the representation of an office position. So what am I going to say about Susie? Well, I haven't heard anything bad, so she must get her standard bonus. Well, is it standard or is it moderately or is it low? And you're just really dartboard thunk. Okay. I think I'm going to give them this much. Or, you know what? We're in a budget conversation right now. Maybe I just don't give her that much because if I don't give that much to a lot of them, I can keep under my bonus or under my budget so I can get my bonus. It's all dysfunctional, is what I'm trying to say. These things don't work well because she's looking at going, wow, I can go to the, over there now and make more money because I didn't get really the money I deserve. And we look really weird at people that come in and, and complain. If, if you gave a bonus to somebody or a raise, I remember one young guy, he was a little out of league with it, says, I should have gotten the top end. I don't think so. And we at least had a discussion. And he really thought that he rocked this and this. And says, dude, uh, really, let's take exactly what you think is the reason why. And let's break it down as to why I don't think it is. At the end of it, we agreed, you know what? I probably shortchanged you a little bit, but it's certainly not what you think it is, but I'll be willing to do this. And we negotiated it. And he walked out satisfied that he made his case and got better for it. By the same token, we got real clear, crystal clear on expectations. It really was an excuse of dialogue. We don't tend to do that. I mean, some great leaders do. Go ahead, Dean. 
Oh, well, and, and that's a perfect scenario. That's that's the way things ought to be done. And I'm going to grant you that wholeheartedly. But and here's the big but to this. That's not the way the lawyers want you to do it, especially when you get into a large organization, right? That large organization has got HR people. They've got supervisors upon supervisors, and they want to be able to quantify everything. They've got to be able to put a number to everything and, and spell out, here's the exact structure that defines whether or not you get a raise, whether or not you did a good job, and it all has to be quantifiable. Well, I think my problem with Lauren's story is that it took the employee going to Lauren to fight about Absolutely. it. And the, the statistics show that most females aren't comfortable having that Excellent point. Excellent point. discussion. Excellent point. So you need to be com continuously providing that level of feedback so that in leaving that open door so that people don't feel like they have to come to that apex and have an uncomfortable conversation. It's an absolutely sure. excellent point. I did. Yeah, I didn't say it was the right thing. It had ended up being the thing, but you are dead spot on. Nine out of 10 people, especially female, unfortunately, will never put themselves in that role of, I disagree. Because they're immediately labeled or, or stereotyped in a way that lingers. And it's, it is a, a, a Bullshit bias, to be honest I with did, you. I did it one time uh, early, you know, like 15, when I was still working in hotels and I got, I got my ass handed to me. I had my director of F&B and assistant director of F&B that was like, don't you ever try yeah. to have that conversation with me again. And I was like, wow, I, 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 I would, I've, I probably from an age perspective, if I could go back in time, would be the first to rally everybody going don't take these people seriously. They don't know half the shit they think they know. <laughs> <laughs> and don't put up with no as the first answer, you know? And if they, if they give you that kind of attitude, it's not worth working with them because they don't care about what you're doing. They only care about what you can do for them. And don't, don't be there. Don't do that because there's places that are better than that. Because, like you said, you have to experience a bad culture to understand what a good culture is. Uh, it's a shame that there are bad cultures, but the whole reason why we're having this discussion is because right now we're dysfunctional as an industry. We can't get the people we need for some of the reasons we're talking about. We're not addressing the core reasons of why a excellent female worker who's getting underpaid simply for gender is looking to go to another role that she can't outspokenly say she would prefer to stay if recognized for her talents and value. That's dysfunctional. That, that should never be a case. It's a reality, unfortunately, as does to, for anybody that has limitations due to language, uh, social status, ethnicity, any bias like that. And we know that they exist, unfortunately, within our businesses. We have these stereotypes of what we consider classifications of job qualifications, and we influence it by those kind of things, unfortunately. I used to work for a European company who said, but of course we have to pay men more, more because they have to support their families. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. bogus bullshit. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when was What year was this, Adele? <laughs> um, it, it was either late 80s or early 90s. Well, actually, you know what? In Europe still, you can classify exactly the physicality of the person you want to hire. Young woman, such and such. You can do that still. They can they can literally say I, this is what I want in this role, from a gender perspective and age perspective. You well, can there was be a very long time in hotels where there was a certain stereotype you hired for front desk. Am I wrong? Sure, no, no, it yeah. still exists in some hotels. Let's not even say that it still exists. There are certain hotels that they, I mean, airlines had the same thing for for uh, at the time stewardesses. They had to be of the same size or particular size, particular shape, particular weight. That was a qualifier to it. I mean, yeah, it just it. How is Hooters still in business? <laughs> I don't know. Well, Anna does and other franchises like them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, it, you know, I, yeah, there's a couple other ones that are that play to that. I'm like, how yeah. how have they not been sued out, out of business? I they, I know one Hooters employee who now works for Google. Uh, very, very smart. I hired her at Fuel. Uh, extremely smart. And she said she loved working there. That it was just... The people were great. The company is great. It, I, it, I, but the, the the patrons can't always be great. Probably not. <laughs> Actually, okay. Um, I, this, I, think, I, just, I think I've shared this on the show before, but I used to be a regional manager for a – when Hooters first started in Clearwater, Florida, there was a competitor called Melons. Go figure that name, right? Uh, I ran several of their restaurants. 
And um, we taught the culture of how they protected themselves. We taught them how to serve. We taught them how to defend. We taught them how to dialogue with these, what you would call patrons, as to how to fend. It was a learning cycle for them that they appreciated because it really, you're dealing with attractive women that uh, often don't know how to handle stupid men. <laughs> and it, you know, at the time, it was completely able to be biased. From that, Hooters has evolved to being what they are by brand, but not by culture. Uh, I'm not defending them. I still think that it's a biasness as to the perception of the service and the type of product. But what they've done is that they've really twisted around to be in support of, to be fair, it's a halfway house between a strip club and regular life. Uh, there's a, It's a place where people that are trying to learn a skill that they don't have into a skill that they can make into something else. So whether that adds to the reason why they get the people that they do, but they have totally gone off of from being the place where there's cute girls in small clothing to a place that is burgers and joints by being served by people at Trump. Cause they have guys that are also working there now, but they've really tried to create some sort of support system. Again, not in defense of them because I think it's a, it's a, a bygone era of having that type of business focus. Uh, it just is in existence because they've been able to find adaptive ways to dilute that messaging to be more of, of a broader perspective than what they originally started as. But at the end of the day, it's still attractive people dressed in small clothes. No, even, even within our industry, though, you go back and think think about trade shows of 10 years ago. And what did everybody have? And, and we referred to them like this. So don't please don't take offense by it. But we'd say there's booth babes. And, and that was a thing. Right. Today, you say that and you're like. Wow, did we actually say that? And for the record, for the record, Melissa, we, when Stuart when Stuart was with you, we called him a booth babe, just so you know. We did call <laughs> Stuart a booth babe. Okay. Last high tech I was in, I said, there's booth babe. You know, so yeah, it did. <laughs> it has diluted the message a little bit, but you know. <laughs> yeah. I did put on the Hooters Facebook page, and even as of 2019, they had a swimwear pageant. Sure. And so, a calendar. Yep. Of course. Yeah, I'm not, like I said, I'm not defending the methodology of this. I'm just saying that their existence is based on the fact of their adaptability. In answer to what you're saying, how do they still around? Is Fair. that they have diluted the focus to be more about supportive and equal opportunity and what have you as a response to this process. They've turned into the vanguard of, we understand where we started, but we're not that as much anymore as we are about all the things that we can do to help people, whatever. You know, the reality of it is in time to come, it'll be a buggy whip. It's you know what? I mean, I think it would be amazing if they embraced doing something to empower women. I mean, that would be so interesting if they said, you know, we're providing education. And and well, they do actually have that. They have scholarships. They have scholarships and stuff. They've done those things. Uh, is it their focus? No. <laughs> well, I think they could embrace, like, if they could take on, like, breastfeeding in public as a you know, as like, a, you know, like that would like I could get I could get on board with that. You know what I mean? Like making mm -hmm. that. But also <laughs> to be fair, to see if they have one, because maybe they do. And I just don't know. Uh, now here, here's the other thing to it. To be fair, the patrons that you refer to with the, the scrunchy face um, is also a lot of families now. And I kid you not. There's a lot of I families. Another scrunchy really face. You did get a scrunchy face. The um, chocolate you know, cake is amazing. <laughs> you know, you're, you're bringing little junior you know, to the, to the restaurant and the family, the wives and everything else. It's, it's a weird, how does that work really? You're, it's like, it's, it's kind of, you, you kind of look at it. I do anyway. It's like, if you brought your wife to a strip club, it's like, why? What? <laughs> you know, it's that, that if that is the culture that's there, why are you bringing your family to it? And it goes to what they're trying to focus on. They are a casual dining place that has good wings. They really do. Guard. They're good wings. Um, and they got decent food, but it's bar food, okay? But they have this, they were, they were one of the earliest that had the sports bar culture. They were one of the very first that actually had a sports bar culture. So they have that base of that. They have that type of uh, people coming into it, but they have so much more than that. It's kind of like a McDonald's in the sense of consistency. If you go to a Hooters, you have the Hooters wings, you have the Hooters food, there is an expectation that is consistent. That's a brand value. We talk about that all the time. So. Those things have kept it alive. I mean, I don't think they're growing by leaps and bounds. You know, they did their, their airline thing. That didn't last very long and stuff. That goes back many years. Um, I flew but, Hooters there. I got to say, it was a great experience. They <laughs> tried it. Yeah, they tried it. 
Didn't they have a hotel in Las Vegas for a while? Great snacks. Yes, there, was a, there was a hotel. There, yeah. They've tried different things, you know. But they do support really breast cancer them? research. So I will go on record saying they do support breast cancer research. Yeah. They 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 have they have they have broadened their their perspective enough that to answer your question, they have survived. I don't think the core of what they represent is in the long cycle of life for them. I think they will be whatever it becomes to be more and more. I mean, I think they're going to get varying size of servers. Uh, they're, they're going They already have different, uh, um, um, uh, you know, male, female servers and so forth. They've already diluted that, but that, that physique requirement uh, in the sense is still something that I think they haven't broached yet that they have a variety of sizes. Um, but I think they will. I think they're, if to survive, they're going to have to. But look at all the places that have closed since they've been still open. TGI Fridays, Bennigan's, you know, these places are closed and they didn't have cute girls running around in tight clothes. You know, they were supposed to be a, a brand neighborhood bar that, that didn't survive for a variety of reasons. Like too big of a menu. their own, but I will not take my son to Hooters so that they can see how to... I don't believe that's how you exemplify a female or a woman. That's I guess I'm not disagreeing with you. <laughs> and if you, you look know. on their Facebook page, it's only the pretty ones they show. So, or of course, or whatever. And, and okay, okay, do not call the kettle black, because all of us as marketers turn uh, to the demographics that we most want to personify for the branding and the product that we have. We can't call the kettle totally black on that one because we Fair. do the same thing. Okay. Uh, which I think is also a positive in our environment too, because as we allow more consumer related content into our marketing message, we are inherently bringing the diversification that it provides. That we're not just dealing with the cutesy models that look perfect on the beach at the perfect time with the perfect drink and the perfect background, that we are bringing in the family that brought their cooler on the beach with the blankets and the beach towels and the poopy diaper and everything else. And that's in a picture. And that's on our beach. You know, we are allowing that diversification. And that's you know, I can tell you for sure. On, but. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you for sure that when I look at at something, I, if I I want to see a uh, gorgeous, uh, salt and pepper haired uh, couple, you know, or silvery haired couple, <laughs> I, I really I. If, if if the if everybody who's pictured is you know a teen or twenty something, it, it's not going to appeal to me. Right. And that's what happens a lot. You know, I've ha had this experience myself in a hotel where you know the influencers want to come, and you've got some empty rooms, so you want to invite them. And then your Instagram is full of all these beautiful 20 somethings. And guess what? That's not really what our, our market looked like. But the our market looked like 50s and 60s and 70s, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But that's, so, that, yeah, that, that, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry to remember. Oh, the, the, the bluntness of marketing is what you just described. Oh, I want, oh, I heard about this influencer thing. Let me just get some influencers. And you find somebody that has enough audience that you think, oh, wow, they got 100,000 people to follow them. Ooh. And then you get these things of pictures of 20 year olds in front of us. Look at me, how cool I am. And this, and you're sitting there going, that's really not the person that one can afford that room, too. So putting them into the top suite isn't really the, you know, whatever. But if you, I think one of the best website designs I saw was the dynamic insertion of, of rich media or of images that based on the information that you knew of the person coming to the site, they would show what you would like demographically in the website compared to me demographically to the website compared to, by the way, I'm on the same salt and pepper mode of you, so probably the same pictures. Um, but family versus not, because if I went to a website that had nothing but family pictures, I'm thinking, do I really want to go to the pool with all the kids? I don't have kids. I don't want to be around kids. I'm not going on vacation to be around kids. That may not be the place for me. So a balancing of the mix, but you bring but up a that's really, what your hotel is, then you need to be that. Yeah. Absolutely. But yes. that's and you need to show that to everybody. So if they don't want to be around kids, then it has the effect you want it to. But yeah. seasonally, we know it changes. When it's not kids season, you're not that hotel. So you can't just have static images all the time about kids at your hotel. If at, during school season, that's not what's happening. And you want them to show up in September and October back in historical time cycles. I don't think it's the case this year. Um, 
of where their kids aren't by the pool or the kids aren't on the beach because you want the empty nesters and or families that don't have kids to be at your resort because you don't have them. So that sensitivity to timing of what you're doing messaging, but going back to what I think is a really, really, really solid point that you made earlier, Adele, is that you want to see yourself in the imaging that you're being provided. That requires authenticity variations, gender variations. If you're willing and wanting to have those people come to your resort, which you should, you need to have that. And need I need to ask, also add ADA special needs travelers considerations. You should have somebody that has physical mobility impairment that you have that facility available to them. That if there is great services you're providing for visually impaired people, that you somehow represent that. Whatever it is, you should have proper quality representation of those demographics in your rich media so that you make people know that this is something I can take care of, that we welcome those kind of people without having to say, I welcome the following people. You know, here's a picture. You can get the picture. Yeah. Literally. You know, I've always been a real fan of CrowdRiff, which is um, a tool where they you you can uh, you get picked up on uh, any playtime somebody's tagged your hotel, and you can have on your weddings page all the brides that have tagged, and you can have it on your homepage, or, you know, just general on your child friendly page. You can have ones with kids. It's really nice, and they mostly focus on um, destinations. So it's also great because you can pull in pictures of New York or Colorado or wherever it is that you're from. And it, it's so, so helpful. But I, I have heard that now the rules are got, have gotten much more challenging that just because somebody tagged you doesn't mean that you automatically have approval to use them in the mm -hmm. crowd. Rip. And you well, have to. Yeah, that's where FlipTube is strong. Because Slip2 does give you the permission-based uh, platform to be able to do that kind of stuff. But, yeah, you're right in that sense. It, it, but it, you it, have it. to ask for it, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just because somebody, and we've had this discussion actually on Clubhouse earlier too, is that just because somebody publicly posts something doesn't mean that you can use it for business model. You can't say, oh, you posted that you were at our hotel and you got that sunset picture. We're going to use it for our business. Because without express permission, you're violating privacy. That's it, why it, I hyper hyper. Uh, went out of business. They were doing this big beta with Marriott and then really yep. quick um, they found themselves um, out of business. Yeah, yeah. And th there are some plugins that can provide consumer information up to your website. But again, it's dangerous because just because they pub published it and tagged your property doesn't mean you have the right to put it on your business page as representation of content. There, there, there's things like, so yes, you're absolutely right, Adele. You know, if you're going to do that stuff, which is great stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's great stuff. But yeah, you definitely got to get that. Hey, by the way, we really loved your picture. Can we use it? You yeah. Know? And you know what? I mean, maybe 10% would even respond. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, I feel like the percentage was, re we really love this picture. And they just, I, I don't know, they just it didn't respond so much. I, it, it was really disappointing for me. I feel like I feel I, I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I think if I tag a business in my I, I, I don't have a problem with them doing it. And I think that that went too far. I well, hope they change that rule because I think it's gone too far. Well, I think I think probably the argument would be and the only case I can think of is that if you look at the extreme circumstance, say, for instance, you took the most beautiful picture that you were in, okay, that the property used and they made $10 million off of it. You'd be sitting back going, uh, that was my picture and you got nothing for it. And you didn't even ask me you could use it. So where am I now? You know, I'm flattered that you love my picture. I'm flattered that it did so well for you, but where my money? <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit different than if they used it, you know, on a print ad or something, but if they just shared it on their website inside the crowd riff. Okay, but think of it in reverse. Say they took your picture and they said, well, how come a goofy looking person is this and we don't take these people at our hotel? You'd be like, whoa, 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 what are you using my picture for and bashing me for? I mean, there's extremes to it, I oh, guess, that, yeah. with permission, because you you can say, hey, I tagged the place and they used it and said, this is the person we don't want here and this is it. I'm being extreme, obviously, but you know, you'd be like, what thing? Where did I get all that hate from? You know, but they're saying, hey, you know, you tagged us. We could use it. 
you know, it referred to us. Guys, permission, just... permission aside, should they at least do the courtesy of telling you? And I'll use a, a perfect case example of that. When we lived in Texas, uh, you know, my son was in elementary school, or actually it was preschool, uh, Grand Prairie Independent School District. And when you put your son in the school there, they used to sign these forms to say that if he gets his picture taken, they might put it on their website. So I knew I gave permission. But then one day I'm going and I'm looking at the Grand Prairie Independent School District website, and there he is on the front center page. It was like the home page of the website. I'm like, hey, that's a really cool picture. Maybe you could have told me. <laughs> you know, <rather> than just... <laughs> yeah. Indeed. You know what? Uh, I used to take dance class when I was living in Manhattan. I would take some dance classes at the Alvin Ailey Extension. Uh, it's like a cathedral for dance and and real people can actually go and take dance classes there and and they said always said you're not allowed to take pictures of your class you know not everybody who is you know in their tights or in their you know body yeah, I don't look good in tights I'm just saying I don't look or, in or their or, or their belly dancing gear or their african dance gear whatever it is no, not everybody wants to be on your you know, Facebook in that mm -hmm. particular sporty condition. Um, but so, yeah. and yet people did it all the time. You know, <laughs> also too, a lot of times people are not aware of the laws associated with this, where to Dean, to your point, putting pictures of children on, no, no. Oh yeah, that's not cool. Yeah, you know, no, no, can't do. And yet if they thought it was a great picture and that you could identify the child in the picture, that's that, that goes beyond the courtesy of letting the people know. That's like breaking the law. <laughs> You know, yeah. that kind that of thing. So like, no. That so, definitely always uh, Seeing how Ed and Stuart aren't here to poo-poo on me, there is a tool that I use called EditMate, which is um, uh, it's a QR code that we made for, but it's a platform that is mobile-based. And we're, we put it first to the teams at the hotels to share images. You heard me rant about this all the time where uh, at the property, a lot of people can take some great pictures of things that you as the social media person for that property often don't get. You're not everywhere at all places. So a, a bellman can get a great picture or a front desk or whatever. They now have a place to put this through. They, 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 they go to this app, they QR code it. So they turn to the phone and they go in and they say, my name's Lauren. Uh, this is my email address. This is the picture of videos. I can load up to four and this is what they were. And it sends it up into a, 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 a library that then the social media person can look at and say, oh, that's a great picture, let's use that. But it automatically, with the terms and conditions of the platform, allow us to use the images that are loaded up. So it solves that, do I have permission thing because it's being loaded. So we just started rolling this out for our guests on the little, the uh, I use a changing picture at the front desk that goes through all this stuff and it shows, hey, you wanna share some pictures of your travel experiences with us? Scan here and this is the platform we use, You know, if you want to share them, that they'll go up here and we can use them with your permission. And we do, and we just now started that. And we're getting some, not a lot, just some, because we don't have, you know, um, that they're loading pictures up of stuff. Now, I'll be honest with you, the two thirds of it we ain't ever going to use. I mean, picture of a room, we already have that, thanks. Uh, but there are some really cool pictures of people having fun at the pool, distance. And that's a great because we don't have a picture of people distance at the pool. So thank you. We we're going to use that picture, you know. But yeah. it's a neat platform. It's cheap. I love it. It's called Edit Me. Edit Mate, E D I T M A T E. Oh, um, great. Oh, yeah, I love anyway. that. That's one of those features that I liked about Beekeeper. Um, but uh, that sounds that sounds simple to use. You know what? At at my hotels, the housekeepers would love to always take a picture every time they made a really beautiful um, <laughs> bed welcome. You know, with rose petals and everything for a honeymoon couple or or any kind of special occasion, because they knew that I gobbled those pictures up for mm -hmm. social media. They were so much fun, and they really showed the spirit of the hotel. So they were always trying to outdo each other for creativity, and um, you know. And and it's nice to appreciate them in that way too. You know, it's a, it's a shame. Uh, I wish it was a perfect mix of something that happened. There was one property we have that we've changed our relationship with, which we only handle aspects of the marketing now and not all of it because they changed ownerships and they, of course, changed you know agencies and what have you. We still have things we're doing for them, but one of the things was they were they're pet friendly, and we started an initiative which was really cool where they have uh, bandanas for the puppies two sizes because large and small mm -hmm. and little bowls with their logo on it 
plastic bowls. That was a part of the value proposition of, of charging a pet fee, which we really vanguarded for them to try to do. Plus they get treats at the front desk and there's treats in the little shop and stuff. And you know, it. what happened was it was an Instagram moment for a lot of people where they would post that stuff up. Problem was we had to go through, as we just talked about, the extra stage of, hi, you. that's an awesome picture. Can we use it? I wish I had this platform when I'm doing was doing that because it'd be like, hey, that's not a picture. Can you put it here? You know, because it'd be like, then we can use it straight up because it really helped a lot where they're posting pictures. Because look what we got, and then for us, it's a, it's a whole residual branding because it's little dog bowl that has our logo on it, and they're going to use it at home because they're going to brag about it with their friends. Oh yeah, we got that over and we stayed at such and such. You know, uh, so yeah. it, it's a win for everything. And I just wish I had put this or I had this when we were doing that for them because it'd been like. Wow, we'll be able to get some cool pictures that we don't have to keep asking for. So there's nothing better for social media than cute doggy pictures. Or videos. Where's my puppy? Come on. Where <laughs> <laughs> Always bring our pets up. Maybe pet day. No. Um, I, I can but, arrange yeah. for them. Yeah. Well, you have the big dogs, Dean. Hey, yeah. you see? He's the cutest. He's the cute. Oh uh, no, I'm biased. <laughs> that is incredibly cute. But I have the cutest puppy in the <laughs> <laughs> but anywho, all right. Well, we were all over the place with some of the stuff. We started with Google and Tef Stephanie's T-shirt went from there. There oh, he is. Yes. <laughs> Happy puppy. Um, was there any? I mean, news-wise, I mean, Robert, of course, already warned us on on the uh, tinfoil hat that he wasn't uh, able to get the newsletter out for us, and I don't have the heart to tell him that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I mean, the the news story that's on my mind at the moment is New York. Number two things. Number one, supposedly New York is open for business and open for tourism July 1st, whatever that means. I don't know whether that means, I really don't know if that means that there's just no restrictions as to, you know, quarantining or anything like that, but that's what I heard. And number two, what on earth is this about that you have to, if you want to open a hotel in New York, you have to have it approved by the mayor and city council. Oh my dear! Oh my yeah. dear! I, I I I think the second half one, from what I understand from what I'm talking with, is because so many hotels closed in Midtown, especially I should say, that for them to open up for density of occupancy. They have to get approved that they're not in a. Uh, the unions involved with this too, so I don't know all the detail of that. But the unions involved into the ability for a hotel to open has to reach a qualifier for them for staffing and also the city to approve the density of of occupancy. And they're making them jump through a bunch of hoops. To your point, they're making them through a bunch of hoops to it. And yes, because I mean, here in Florida, we've been open for business the whole time, and. I despised it to be honest with you because I think it's it only put us in jeopardy because our numbers are artificially created because people may get sick and leave the state because they're here as tourists. And so we don't get the number impact, but all said and same uh, beach hotels down here are, I mean, if you own a beach hotel, more power to you, man, they're full seven days a week, nonstop. The problem that they're having too is there's just no staff. There's restaurants down here that are closing two days out of the week simply to give their team their crew rest. Good for them. The only way that they're able to give them time off is to literally close the restaurant. Even though I see them because I live by a bunch of them when I walk the, uh, our dog, um, the, the people show up thinking that it's open because it usually is. But they just don't have enough people to run seven days a week and they can't find people. And and it's it's really amazing. The And the hotels down here, the same thing, the beachfront hotels, you know, the Fort Myers beach places and stuff like this. They're just pissing people off. People are showing up. The rooms aren't getting cleaned. They're they're showing up to be checked in, and they're waiting all day before the room gets clean before they can get into it. And even then, it's like you're questioning whether it was actually cleaned. If there's still stuff in the bathroom, you know, just stuff that you know are making the local news features. Let's put it that way. And all they're being told is, "Oh yeah, your room is not ready. Just go out to the beach." It, the the service level is abysmal. It's not it's even, so even in the classification of service, let alone hospitality. I, it's I wonder tall. if that getting permission from the mayor thing, I want to go back to that. I wonder if that, especially in New York, where you've got the, the unions are a big thing. I wonder if that is to stem some of the progress of Airbnb. 
because in New York mm -hmm. too, you, you've got people that have Airbnb buildings uh, for all practical purposes. Super host, yeah, super host. And, and, yeah, I wonder if that kind of pushes that down a little bit. How many? Maybe. How many? Ho how many non-union hotels will open up under those circumstances? None. I don't. I don't think they can. I don't think right. they can. I don't. I think that if any hotel is going to want to open up as a hotel, because that might also be, you know, as you bring that up, Dean, it might be an interesting point because a lot of hotels are not reopening as hotels. They're opening up as condos. They're opening up as as uh, something else, whatever they may be. Hotels, apart hotels. Right. Yeah. And yes, the the, uh, the New York Hotel Association, which I, was, uh, I you know, yeah, they're pretty powerful, <laughs> and. Uh, they might have an influence on saying that this is a way of governing the reintroduction of accommodations in the, in the metro area. Because, yeah, to your point, it might be really easy for somebody to say, screw it, I'm not going to be a hotel, but I will be a wonderful Airbnb in Midtown. Yeah. Because basically the facilities are the same, and I'll just do a different medium of selling it. So, yeah, maybe it is a way of regulating that. I don't know. We'll have to look more into it. Adele, that's your home turf, so I'm sure you'll know more about it. To the to who donates to the mayor's campaign? <laughs> the mayor's keep me alive and in, in, in office because I'm screwed up. Fun that one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it is amazing how politics have become so pervasive in our business operations. I have to say, I've never been so politically attuned. I mean, Holly is the apex of that. Just for those who follow Holly, she is on the extreme of attentiveness to politics. And then I'm somewhere down the scope, and then there's the uh, I don't really care people on the other side. But uh, it is amazing how politics have such a strong influence now on business choices that we didn't realize until we see it in the news so much. And, of course, we, the people have such a strong opinion on so many different aspects of it, I guess. But anyway, with that being said, uh, was there of any context of anything else that we may have not have discussed that we wanted to make sure we talked about today since it's kind of a free-for-all? I just want to throw out there, I've got both my shots. So I'm going to be in Atlanta during Hunter Conference. And then uh, so if anybody uh, will be there in Atlanta, whether you're going to Hunter Conference or not, then I would love to meet up because I'm going to give everybody hugs and handshakes. Oh, I'm going to dress up as a bear and hike that. Just, you know, bear hugs. Bear hugs. <laughs> I'm probably not going to go to a single session if I can make it out there. I'm just going to be out there going like, hey, just hug everybody. Yeah, I'm with you on that no, one. It's don't like, squash people, though. We, you know, we, we, need, we still need them. <laughs> <laughs> just squeeze a little bit cheaper out of them. Um, but, yes, I, I, I think I'm targeting high tech is my first. In, because it's in Dallas. I have clients in Dallas. Yeah. We have friends in Dallas. We used to live in Dallas. Uh, so we'd spend – and my wife doesn't want me to fly yet. So uh, we're probably going to drive out because we'll bring the puppy with us. So it'll be a few days out. It'll be a few of you know, the week there, a few days more afterwards, maybe on the way back. But I think I really think that if any benchmark of a big conference for hospitality, I think high tech has that potential because it is in September. Hopefully by then we'll have a better perspective as to what we can and can't do. I don't know if anybody watched the draft last night, but dang, that was incredible. Yeah, whole first round. Had to so many people. So oh many people. Oh my God, there. it was amazing. I'm sitting there at first. My, you know, my normal one year in reaction is like, oh, how dare they? And I'm like, oh no, how cool, <laughs> you know, just to be able to be in that 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 group environment thing. But yeah, we had to watch the whole first round because as a Buccaneer fan, we were last in the first round. <laughs> I'm glad you're optimistic about high tech because I feel like there's no way they're going to be able to get that exhibit hall filled like they have in the past. I don't know. I, I think they might. Yeah, 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 I don't. You got, you got, don't forget, you've got a hoa in August too. Well, I mean, this yeah. high tech happens Sorry. at the same time as HSMI marketing and HSMI HSMI right. revenue management. So I think, right. but I mean, there's at least when I've gone to both in the past, there's been like almost no overlap. And I know, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of vendors still hurting that aren't going to be like, yeah, let me drop twenty grand for a booth again this year. I mean, yeah, I don't think they'll go for twenty grand. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Melissa, do you think you guys are gonna? You guys would normally get a booth at High Tech previously, right? Yes, we have been at High Tech previously. I don't know what's being planned right now. Right. <laughs> well, I, I, I here here's a possible prediction I have. I agree with you on the skepticism of of actual expensive participation in High Tech. I think there is going to be this. Okay, are we financially confident enough to drop that kind of coin? 
yeah for a uh, 10 foot square okay plus so pay you know their money at high tech is the booths right i mean right but i think with the collaboration of the hsmi stuff and yes I, I, there is an overlap actually i was always pissed irritated uh that rocka dropped in on high tech and it overlapped one of the days that i would normally be booth hopping because I thought it was like, wow, you know, because I think Stuart was complaining about it where, you know, you had to drop a large amount of money to be at high tech. You wanted the audience at, Re at the Rock, but that was another booth drop. And you couldn't staff both also without having to spend all. So it really was a thanks for the either or that. I mean, I think Ed dropped out completely because he was tired of the conflict of which way do I go or whatever. And just attend. Go ahead, Seth. Well, I was going to say the other, the other caveat is the lodging conference is at the same time. Yeah. And that is a dilution. Oh, I agree with you. Not a I, good, I, good planning yeah. on somebody's yeah. part. <laughs> I th yeah, I think also um, there is the possibility that we have become adaptive in some things. I used to do this as a poach, but I used to go over and and just social fence the conferences and tell people to meet me at a bar off the off the press. Yeah. <laughs> and just have you know, I wouldn't be being for a booth, but I'd do business. So I think there's. <laughs> Just saying, just, I don't know. I don't know who does this stuff. But <laughs> marketing skills on the dark side. Um, but <laughs> there are plenty of venues around the venue and plenty of opportunities for the duration of it that you could probably create sub areas of not having to pay for the square footage on the floor, but still get the benefit of the attendance in the market. Um, I think there's that possibility because with how people are more comfortable with this kind of dialogues, um, there's also the fact that you can just again poach the location and connect the dots. So, not that I was planning on doing it much or a lot, whatever, but just saying. <laughs> oh, just the fact that we know most of the people that are that we want to talk to who are going to be there. Look, I don't, I don't need a registration list to know that you're going to be there. Right. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah. Hey, Lauren, let's meet up. <laughs> I, I'm thinking a keg in the corner, and I'm good for population. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I it's going to be interesting because because for, like for the draft last night, the surge of that number of people, I mean, was impressive. I don't I don't remember any time that they've done the draft to having that density of a general population outside of the venue. I know they did an open air venue and stuff, so people could kind of you know, see some of the stuff to it, but that was like a major event. I don't know what the numbers were that they had of it, but that was a, a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and uh, it's Cleveland and nothing against Cleveland, but that's a huge turnout for a city. I would see that as New York thing, maybe, or LA thing or Dallas thing or Houston. That was Cleveland. And there was uh, six figure numbers of people in the general population. And that doesn't include everybody that was actually in the event itself. I thought it was pretty cool. They also brought up people from each of the teams to go over and see who got drafted first in, in his chair before they go. I thought it was a nice touch. Uh, I love how the fact they always boo him when he gets on. It's kind of like a tradition. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, it, it's in Belichick, lucky little bastard, man. Just sat there and waited for the quarterback to land in his lap. I mean, come right. on. It's just sitting there going, dang. Anyway, that's football stuff. Anyway, um, so yes, I think I think of anybody that's planning conferences in a person first person sense, there is the potential of massive growth. But I think the only variation is to whether or not we we don't talk about this because we're biased in the U.S. What's happening in India is a sheer flat out tragedy, tragedy of epic yeah. proportions that we don't even know the true genuine the, the true numbers of this stuff yet. You know, hey, we know it's underestimated. You because know, Google. Just just Google COVID nineteen stats, and and, it, and Google gives you a nice little line graph. And by default, it'll show United States. It'll show new cases and deaths. Change that default to worldwide, and look at the difference. It is stunning. Yeah. Worldwide, it's still going up, folks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And 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 and, and you know, I have clients in Canada, and they joke, but it's a serious joke, if you know what I mean. That we are hoarding because we bought everything. Uh, vaccinations, and we, yeah, we're still trying to struggle for people to take the vaccines, but we're sitting on three times the population worth of vaccines. And it's like Canada's waiting for their one plane a day. We need to give it away. You know what? It, I, my husband we just went to the Walgreens, and there was nobody online, hmm. and, and they were saying, hey, don't you want to get your vaccine? And he goes, I've already gotten both shots. There was nobody there to give it to. Right. I mean, Give it to Canada, give it to Mexico, give it to someplace. 
Yeah. They use it so badly. Yeah, Canada's yeah. yeah. in their what they call their breaker, uh, which is they flip the switch that no distance travel, stay only in your living environment. And if it's essential travel, you have to prove it. They have they actually have roadblocks wow. that they have, and they find people serious money if you try to go outside of your zone without legitimate reason. And um, there is no travel, there is no transient. And the border is locked down until towards the end of May. They're hoping to have 40 to 60% vaccination rate. Everybody's waiting for the, they have no issue about anybody not wanting to take the vaccine. vaccine. It's a matter of supply for the vaccine. And the border staying closed and the business effect from it simply because of lack of vaccinations for it. EU's the same way, same stuff. And yet we're sitting on three times the load. And it's like India, we're sending over what? A few hundred air, uh, oxygen tanks and, and uh, uh, respirators. Like you look at the numbers that just the tragedy. I mean, I watch BBC news because I always want that outside the US perspective in some ways. It is, tier, I mean, remote, where I have to stop watching it. Uh, it, it the tragedy of, of people, no place to go. There's I saw no place a thing on TV the other day of, of uh, mass cremations in the square in, in a city square. They had just sectioned off a city block, and they were burning bodies in it. Yeah, because they have no place else. Just like, the, oh the, the funeral pyres, literally yeah. biblical funeral yeah. pyres of cities that that are burning because they just there's no people going to hospitals that have no room, no capacity, no no facilities, and no and the black market can't even get the stuff that they would extort people from they can't get oxygen tanks they can't get respirators they can't get any of this stuff it's it's that's the second largest populated country in the world uh, by massive amounts and the numbers they're only they're only accounting people according to IC, you know, uh, hospitals uh, they're not counting all the people that die that the hospitals don't account for so they're saying that it's even underestimated by at least twice as much of what is actually happening and it's not even hitting our news on a regular basis. That's the biasness of that. No, that's very true. You, you watch the international news like BBC, you'd be amazed how different the news, the news is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is true. <laughs> yeah, not to keep going down or on top of it, but just I, I, I talked to Lily and I asked for permission on this. Um, Lily's mom, Julie, who's a remarkable person for the times I've engaged with her, was just diagnosed with stage four cancer, uh, given a very, very, very short, as in days, time to live. Mm. Um, and uh, she did put up a, I think, a GoFundMe, uh, just because this is not a financial thing that most people are prepared for. Uh, I will share the link in the show notes uh, mm -hmm. for anybody interested in that. Um, uh, I just, it, it's hard to, I mean, I kind of equate it to you're sitting on the earth and watching the meteorite come down on your head. You know that it's going to happen, you know, uh, just how do you deal with that in the short term that you have? And it's not just the duration of time, then all of a sudden everything goes up. There's a degradation that goes on from all this. And it's it's you hate when you know somebody that does this. You know this happens, but knowing that person it makes it. Uh, and, and I'm not close to her. It just I engage with her because I do the podcast with Lily. So I Julie's the one that sends the information up, and we go back and forth. And we have a from running joke that if I run late loading it, she gives me crap. And it's just you know the person in some way, and then to know that this is happening to him, you know, it, it, the mortality is a a bitch when it's real. <laughs> and not how we often treat it, where it's like, oh, yeah, we're all going to die. It's easy to say. It's when you know that's going to happen in a certain way, mm, that changes the world. So uh, just thoughts and prayers for her in that sense that that's, that's happening. And like I said, I'll put the link for if anybody feels inclined uh, to help with that. I know she's one of many. The world's full of it. We just talked about India. Just sometimes one person can. I mean, I love the Good News Network. I love if anything that came out of COVID that I've thoroughly been happy about is the Good News Network. I don't know. I, I just... I love the premise of it. I love what it's done, and I love its consistency. I know it got sold off to ABC and all this other stuff, but I still love that they do it, and they still focus on just good news. I haven't uh, heard of this. What is that? A Google Googleable term? Good news network? Yeah. You don't know what good news network? No. Ah, uh, but I'm very interested. <laughs> oh, it is. Um, who's John the guy from from uh, the office? John Krasinski. Huh? John Krasinski. He started it out of his home as a podcast or as a, vi a video thing, hundreds of thousands of people follow. He just, he did it all. His daughter created the logo with crayons, you know, and just focused on good news. And then he got a lot of famous people involved that would be a part of it. Like he, uh, the weather forecast with uh, Brad Pitt or something. Yep, it's nice outside. You know, just funny stuff 
that made you smile. And uh, it, now uh, it gets so popular. Love they it. got, they got <laughs> millions of followers and so forth. They sold it to ABC so they could bring it into a larger audience. Um, he does stuff every once in a while, but he is, but it went around the world. A lot of com uh, countries created their own good news network uh, chapter or whatever, and they did good news for their country. And beautiful. It, it was just an awesome thing. It's still awesome. And just, it, I keep it in the Facebook feed and stuff. It's just, it brightens my day, you know? <laughs> and that's the other thing too. I think from a news perspective, they realized there was so much bad news. It was good to have some good news. So a lot of news agencies I've found have, have added their feel good stories at the end. Mm -hmm. I like that. I wish there was more of it. I wish that would that actually would dominate more of the news. But the fact that they're even just doing that, I think is a good positive out of this past year as well, that they realize reporting the news doesn't always have to be tragedy and pain. It unfortunately is, but that, the fact that they add more stuff to it makes it pretty cool. So, yeah. Hey. Coming from New York uh, to Charleston, now the news that I watch has how the high school um, baseball team did. <laughs> hey. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Uh, tomorrow Boat brings up the fact of Hamilton. That, uh, I never say his name right, but he is brilliant. I mean, the I mean, Lynn Manuel. And my wife, Miranda. Miranda, yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but in 2020, before COVID worked <laughs> in March, uh, I was at high at the, uh, the uh, digital marketing conference, and uh, Jenny, uh, uh, Jenny from uh, uh, Tyson from uh, HSMAI said she just scored in the lottery two uh, tickets to Hamilton that night. And I bailed on everybody that night because I was having a cocktail hour. Yes, thank you, Steph. For, yeah, I know you're young. Thanks for hosting that while I was gone. And I have a picture of Jenny and I with the stage behind us just beaming. Like, look where we are. You know what I mean? Who would have thunk that was, a, that was the last thing before everything unraveled? You know what I mean? That's one of my most cherished pictures is look what I got. I mean, I got to go see Hamilton in person, you know, in Broadway. And it was my first Broadway show I ever went to in person. So wow. my first Broadway show was Hamilton in person. And then all of a sudden. Start. Huh? That was a good place to start. Right? It's like everything else is going to be like, eh, it wasn't Hamilton. You know, I mean, I'm just. <laughs> but, but then, of course, watching it on when they put it on TV was a blast, too, because then I got to see the original characters do it. I no deference to the original cast. I like the cast I saw because I saw them in person. I thought there yeah. was some, you know, there were certain characters in the cast that I saw that I'm like, I think they did a better job, you know, compared to the original cast from Hamlet. But it's amazing those little snapshots that we have in our history of this stuff. And again, just to tie it to what we do this for, marketing is about that. We need to tie what we're talking about is to rebringing back those feelings of what people enjoyed prior to what we went through, under the perspective of what they are looking forward to, and. Not it's not about us selling something. It's about us sharing the possibility of an experience. And bad marketers are just throwing out rates and dates, and they're blind or oblivious to whatever it is they're doing. And good marketers are bringing back what it is that people are interested in in a way that they want to know more about. Which, uh, unfortunately, I'm seeing a big. I mean, we can talk about this another time, but a big polarity of evil marketers and good marketers, or bad marketers or good marketers, because. They're, they're just some people are just dusting off what they were doing prior to COVID and turning it back on, and it's tone deaf. It's just there's no relevant value to what they're promoting out there at this time. So anyway, well, I have to run. So it was yeah. No, we're good. We're, 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 we're there. It's um, been a while. So hey, thanks for popping in. It's been a while in that sense. I mean, you've been busy as heck and hiring new people and beating them down, to demoralizing them into submission. I appreciate that. It's all good. <laughs> Do what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that in mind, we'll start with the ladies first. Melissa, if people want to know more about you, where is it they can find you? And, of course, your award-winning podcast and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, you can find everything about fuel at fueltravel.com, including the podcast. If you want to connect with me, I am on LinkedIn and on Clubhouse at Melissa Cavanaugh with a K, no U. Adele, for those who want to know more about you, what do you do? Where they can find you? Oh, your audio, 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 audio. You muted. 
There he so is. My dog was barking. Can you hear me now? My there dog was barking. I had to turn it off. You can find me on AdeleGutman.com. And uh, I'm going to put a, a link in the notes because I want everybody to be able to see uh, my podcast episodes uh, with links oh, to the um to the to the uh, podcast that I mentioned with uh, Christine Trippi and and all the other wonderful guests that I've had on the show. So thank you so much. Perfectly well. <laughs> Stephanie for World Peace, World Hunger Solutions, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, where can they find you? <laughs> Lots of goals. Um, Stephanie Smith, CogwheelMarketing dot com. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Stephanie Sparks Smith, and. Um, yeah, hopefully in, in, in Atlanta in two weeks if, if you're so inclined. So let me know. You got to share pictures. You got to do that whole envious thing. Look at me, not you. Look at this. Oh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to maximize it. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Especially considering the flights that I, I just bought flights to Atlanta and Dallas, and they were astronomical. And mm. I was like, why Why am I paying $600 for flights to go to major markets right now? What? Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Did not like that, but maybe they had to buy lumber and car rentals too. I'm trying to get a car in Dallas. I can't find one cheaper than sixty five dollars a day in Dallas. Oh yeah, get off airport and get it. Yeah, yeah. it's it's insane. It's insane though. That the whole thing about rent cars. Yeah, down here there is no rent cars. People are showing up as preferred members and they're not getting rent cars, even though they were promised or reserved one. They don't have them. It's 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 insane. Um, Mr. Dean, for all things amazingly wonderful that you do, where is it they can find you? No, oh, well, and, and actually, speaking of world hunger, I'm in the Midwest here, and so it's lunchtime right about now. And I'm, <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so you can find me basecampmeta.com, metasearchmarketing.com, all your educational needs if you need to learn about what the blazes is this meta search thing, uh, or if you just need somebody to run that campaign for you, or if you're a small hotel that nobody else would talk to about running meta search, I can help you with all those things. Perfect. Well, for anyone that wants to play back this amazingly fun show and all previous 298, we will be on number 300 next week. And we will have a guest host with us number next week, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we're clicking over to the threes, which only means more editing work for me. But that's just another story. Carrie? Um, <laughs> huh? Carrie? Yeah, Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. Yeah, Thank Carrie's going to be with us next week. Yep, Carrie's with us next week. Great host. Um, Great guest. Yep, it'll be fun. It'll be enjoyable. Please all and come on and ask intelligent questions so we all look smart. Uh, but she it, we had a pleasant conversation with her, and she's really excited to be joining us next week. And what better than to have a 300 than to have a special guest? Host? So it works out well. Um, but you can get the uh, previous Lauren? episode. Huh? I said, Lauren, where can they find you? Oh, me, hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live for this and all the other shows, plus the podcast. Plus, if you're interested in Clubhouse and you're an iOS member because we're snobbish like that, uh, you can get the Clubhouse app uh, and join us at noon, Monday through Thursday, every uh, where we do the same kind of stuff, only in audio. Maybe and I sound Eastern. much better than I look. Huh? If you need an invite, I've got some. Yeah, I got invites too. Yeah, please. Yeah, it just we don't, the only thing about weird is when you have to ask people for their phone number. Like, yeah, I need your yeah. phone number. Like, mm -hmm. but you need the phone number to go over and send the invite. So, I promise not to keep it and put it in my custom audience file or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> But with that in mind, thank you, everyone, for spending the time. I I always enjoy the conversation tremendously. Look forward to everyone next week and uh, 11.30 a.m. Eastern U.S. time Friday. And, of course, we simulcast this on Wednesday for Sydney and London times. Um, so, anyway, thank you, everyone. And we will see everyone hopefully next week. <laughs>